Hello. Hi. Hi, hi. What happened? I think I lost I lost uh, my I lost my Wi-Fi for some reason. I for lost my now. wife. <laughs> I lost my yeah, exactly. Wi-Fi. <laughs> Hopefully that doesn't happen again. You didn't stop uh recording or anything, did you? No, no. Did you? Alright, good. We should still be in sync. No, no, we no. We are no, in Sintonia. <laughs> Indeed. Right. Shall we start yeah. before it breaks again? Yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> Two friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Two friends just made a podcast. It's called Culture Bucket. Two friends just made a podcast. Two good friends just made a podcast. Hello all and welcome back to Culture Bucket. It's a pleasure to be here with you on our very special 42nd episode, episode number 42, um, which is exciting because 42 is my favourite number and lots of people will know why that is. Um, But also exciting because today we're doing another top five countdown as per usual in our standard episodes. And we're counting down our top five films from the years 2010 to 2019. <clears throat> but I can't do it alone. I have to have my co-host with me. Otherwise, I'll panic. And <laughs> here she is. It's Alex. Hi, George. Hi, everyone. Hi, Alex. Don't panic, hi, George. Hi. I'm always I'm here not, by your side. Yay. Yay. Thank you. How are you, George, today? I'm um, good. I'm still relaxed. I'm still on holiday. Things are going well. Um, well, things are going <laughs> neutral, really, but that's better than uh, better than normal. So, yeah, no, it's great. How are you? I'm great, same as you. Things are going neutral. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad we're both neutral. Neutral people. Um, well, we had busy yeah, weekends, there's... so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, you went to a wedding. I went to my first Italian wedding. Uh, wow yeah which was great uh but i spent three days <clears throat> constantly with people which i haven't done in two years so today i'm like yeah. <laughs> um yeah, yeah man yeah but it was good it was good lots of food lots of um alcohol uh a very very long mass yeah, church is very long here. But yeah, it was exciting and nice and uh, yeah, a good experience. You went to a festival. I did. I went to a music festival um, of tribute bands, uh, which was pretty good. It's one that's held every year in Manchester. And uh, it used to be free. And this year, because they've had to take <laughs> a year off and stuff and things, they had to charge um, 10 whole pounds uh, oh for each day. Goodness. I know, crazy times. But it was really good. You get to see lots of, uh, I don't know, you just get to stand around in a field and um, listen to people play songs by bands that you like. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty great. I saw a pretty fantastic R.E.M. tribute act and uh, I ate some of the worst food I've ever eaten in my life. So, <laughs> Is, is it a camping good. festival? No, no, good Lord, no. It's it's just in, it's in like a park in the middle of um, Prestwich in Manchester. It's called Festwich. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, uh, yeah, you just you just go and then at the end of the day you go back to your house or wherever you're staying and then you go there the next day. So they sort of organise it by the first day was all tributes to sort of metal b- bands and then the second day is all tributes to more sort of classic rock acts. So on the first day you had like a System of a Down tribute, a Guns N' Roses tribute, a Tool tribute and then on the second day it was stuff like R.E.M. had a tribute act, Madness had a tribute act and O'Gallagher had a tribute act. So it was good, it was fun. It was fun to go on both days, enjoy yourself. Um, but yeah, I brought a tri- I brought a chicken wrap that uh, I could have filled a mug with the amount of grease that dripped off it while I was eating it. It was the worst thing I've ever had. <laughs> that ever. sounds exciting. So I've been watching lots of um, YouTube clips of Kitchen Nightmares and the amount of times that Gordon Ramsay squeezes something and grease comes out. 
Oh. It was that. It was that exactly, oh. but worse. It was worse. It was like so. I felt like I'd coated my mouth with oil when I finished <laughs> eating it. It was really, really, really was bad. Was it just like a normal um, chicken wrap? What do you mean? Like what? What is it? Was it like a Mexican chicken wrap? Was it an Italian? No. Chicken? Well, the, the the stall was called like Double XL Big Grill. And um, me and my brother queued up and ordered at the same time, and we both ordered a chicken wrap, and we both got handed completely different things. <laughs> and he had a lovely, delicious wrap, and I had this mad thing that was falling apart and just had oil like falling out of it. it oh, was, was, yeah, <laughs> nice. But, but it's fine because later I had a paella where the rice was so undercooked that it was crunchy. So you know, <laughs> it wasn't only that store that failed. Sounds, sounds amazing. Come on, come yeah. on, uh, festival uh, food stalls. You can do better than that. Yeah, it's bit, they've been better than that in the past. But I guess that you know they've they've not they've been out of practice, haven't they? They'll get they'll get there. I guess. They'll get yeah, because I've had some amazing um, food at festivals. Oh yeah, definitely. I've had amazing food at festivals and stuff, and 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 at this festival in the past. So. I'm sure that they'll they'll get there, and and I think from that exact stall in the past, I've had a really nice chicken wrap. I don't know what happened. They must have, I don't know. I don't know what happened. They must have just given um, you the end. Were they busy? No, they were re- they were reasonably busy, but not crazy busy. But it was like I don't know. Like my brother ordered it, and a guy on the right side of the tent just went and made it and gave it to him. But I ordered it, and the guy I ordered it from just turned around, and there was this woman stood at the back of the tent just madly flinging ingredients onto a tortilla wrap, and she was already doing it before I'd even ordered my food. And then she, he turned and said to her, oh, have you got a wrap? And she went, oh, yeah, yeah, And she just finished flinging stuff onto this thing, wrapped it up and handed it to him, and that was the one I got. It was also so hot, that, it, and it was wrapped in foil. It burned my fingers. <laughs> I had to eat it so quickly because it was burning me. It was the most unpleasant food experience <laughs> Hot burning oil. Wow. With a side of chicken. Yeah, good um, experience back at festivals. <laughs> yeah, but it was a great weekend overall. The the, the music was was wonderful. Um, so today, um, we're doing top five films from the year twenty ten to twenty nineteen. What is that decade called? Before we start. I don't know. Tennies. Teens. <laughs> well, I've been looking it up. The tens. And. There's there's a bunch of options. There's the tens, there's the teenies, the tenors, um, the tensions, the wonders. Apparently, the, in in Australia, they had a um a newspaper poll to decide what this decade should be called, and the winning vote was for the wonders. That's like O N E dash D E R S. The wonders. Um. Yeah, I'm not convinced. I yeah. think it doesn't it doesn't sound it doesn't flow very well, but I think the most accurate and best choice uh that we should go with is the tens. The tens. The tens. Yeah. Not a clever pun, but and the tenties just sounds stupid. It's like you're camping or something. So Oh, I like the tenties though. Tenties. No, the t- tenties is silly. No. Okay. I, don't. I mean it keeps consistency. Yeah. Noughties, tenties, twenties. Yeah. But it just doesn't work. You can't just you can't just arbitrarily add T's onto the end of any number. <laughs> it's not how it works. <laughs> okay, so, so the we're tens. gonna call them I the tens. I think tens. we're gonna go with the tens. The tens. So our top five films from the tens. Um, the hardest list by far that I've had to do yeah. so far for this podcast yeah. took me forever, but we'll talk about that in more detail uh, in a little bit. But first of all, let's catch up on some popular culture. Boom. Jingle time. This is culture catch up time. This is where we talk about what we've watched, what we've read, what we've listened to, and probably some other stuff. Talk to me, George. What do you have to tell me this week? What are you going? Okay, to this week. Coach, I've got up me. four. I've got four films to shoot at you and an album. Nice. So nice. Um, to start with, at the start of my summer holidays, I did a triple day at the cinema with my uh, cinema fa- friends. Um, triples They've is safe. They've got a funny name. Best. You've got a funny the cineworms. The cineworms. The cineworms. The Cineworms. So the Cineworms went to the cinema together and burrowed down into some seats. We did Triples is Safe, Triples is Best. So we did a triple bill at the cinema. Mm-hmm. Um, 
Uh, I'm not going to talk much about two of the movies we saw. All three of the movies we saw were pretty poor. <laughs> but um, two of them were The Crude 2, A New Age, which was horrifically awful, and we were the only people in the cinema. Um, there's no point talking about that in any more detail. And no, what, uh, the what, one was What's escape- your review on Letterboxd? Oh, I'm not a box my review because it's called The Crudes and New Age. So my review, pretty clever stuff. I, I, I wrote The Crudes, a, a poo age. <laughs> uh, and then I wondered whether to put that on our Instagram like I do with some of our letterboxed reviews. And uh, I didn't <laughs> because I felt embarrassed. Um, but yeah, The Crudes, a, a poo age was not good. Uh, even though it features, I mean, the voice, I, I don't want to, this isn't one of the films I'm talking about, but the voice cast of this movie is crazy. Every voiced character I've heard of the actor who plays them, we've got like, Emma Stone, Ryan Reynolds, Nicolas Cage, uh, Claire Keener. Mm-hmm. Is, is that her name? I think so. Um, Peter Dinklage, uh, <laughs> Leslie Mann, um, Kelly Marie Tran is in there. Like, it's crazy. Like, Cloris Leachman, it's got an amazing A star voice cast and it's awful. Never mind. Uh, the, and Escape Room 2, a tournament of champions, the second film in the Escape Room series, it was pretty enjoyable actually, but there's not much to talk about with it. So, you know, just check it out if you get a chance. The third film, however, has been like 25 years in the making. So incredibly excited to see it. What an incredible project. It's finally with us. Space Jam 2, A New Legacy. The second Space Jam movie. Have I you didn't even know it was coming the... out until you told me. I completely missed oh, that. Really? I completely missed that out. I was like, what? <laughs> have you seen? What? Is have LeBron you... James acting? The only time I saw him acting was in uh, Trainwrecked. Oh, yeah, but people like him in Trainwreck, right? I've never yeah, seen Yeah, because it's LeBron James. Like, it's just him being silly, but come on to and it's like a well, limited what do you think is do, what, what wait what do you think he's doing in this movie he's no, not like shooting for the, an Oscar. okay like in train wrecked he's in the film probably for i don't know 15 minutes this is a two-hour films with him like you can well, take lebron yeah, well, james nah, for 15 but, minutes i don't know if i could take two hours of that but you know let me know surprisingly he kind of i mean he's in it for more than 15 minutes but not for the full two hours as okay. you might think yeah He's a, he's a bit of a lazy boy compared to Michael Jordan, who really put the put put the hours in on set. Have you seen the original Space Jam? Yeah, I love the original Space Jam. Good, me too. I adore so the original Space good. Jam. You got Michael Jordan, yeah, greatest NBA player of all time, I suppose. I don't know too much about basketball. You got Looney Tunes. <laughs> I do know enough. I do know plenty about the Looney Tunes. I adore them, and you know you've got them in there. You've got one of the best film soundtracks ever, in my opinion. I think the the soundtrack to the original Space Jam is great, even though it. I was featuring R. Kelly song. Um, you got Bill Murray cameo. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love the original Space Jam. I love the original Space Jam so much that when it came out in the cinemas, uh, I wanted to go and see it, and I was quite young, and my dad, who is not a fan of Looney Tunes or basketball, uh, refused to take me to see it, so I locked myself in the toilet until he agreed. Yeah. So that is my history with, with Space Jam. Yeah. Um, Space Jam 2 has been you know a super long time coming they wanted to make it back in the 90s with Michael Jordan but he you know he said he he said no basically um, which is fair enough he's not an actor I guess he didn't (coughs) want to make loads of movies he'd Mm. made the one and it was pretty big why risk the failure Um, and then I think for a while they tried to get a project off the ground with Kobe Bryant um, but then you know he sadly passed away um Last year, I don't mm. know if that. I don't think that's why it wasn't made with him, but it, it it didn't happen with him in the end. So they've gone with, um, I guess, the third best choice, LeBron James, King James. Yes. Um, I don't know much about him, but he's a big, famous basketball player. I think probably not quite as famous as Michael Jordan was in the nineties, but still pretty well known. I'd heard of him, had, and you'd heard of him. I think so it's pretty. That, I think it's like the Michael Jordan of this generation, isn't he? Yeah, I think so, but still not quite. I mean, I, I don't think there's anyone who's the Michael Jordan of this generation, if you see what I mean. Yeah, I guess so. Like that guy was that guy was that guy controlled culture in the nineties. Like the sh- sure. just the shoes, just the Air shoes Jordans are, and right. stuff is still a thing. Yeah, you're right. Right, like LeBron James is huge. I've heard of him, and that's better than like ninety nine percent of other. <laughs> like I've heard of Kobe Bryant, Michael Jordan, and then a few of a handful of others from that era. But like, that's kind of your lot. So yeah, no, he's up there for sure. Um, Space Jam A New Legacy is a film that doesn't try to be a sequel to the original Space Jam it's sort of other than briefly actually showing the poster for the original Space Jam on screen in, in, a, in a weird scene at one point you don't really ever get any real 
Uh, there's a handful of mentions, but it, it doesn't treat itself like a sequel to the original Space Jam. It treats itself like its own original thing. Mm. The idea <clears> being <throat> that um, Warner Brothers have created an algorithm uh, called that an algorithm that is, I guess, trying to find new ways to improve Warner Brothers' uh, success as a movie studio. Mm. Um, the algorithm is voiced and acted by Don Cheadle, uh, playing a character called Al G. Rhythm. Mm. And um, he comes up with an idea to uh, scan LeBron James's image into the serververse, which is where all of the Warner Brothers... <laughs> intellectual properties are saved such as the dc characters and the looney tunes and you know count harry potter and the matrix and all these and then um digitally insert lebron james into all these other movies to create new versions of the films uh, but with lebron james acting in them so the film opens with lebron james getting called into warner brothers to uh get this idea pitched to him he brings his son along with him who there's, there's a whole thing in the movie where basically his son could be a good basketball player, but prefers video games and wants to be a video game developer. And LeBron James basically ignores the fact that his son wants to be a video game designer and just tries to force him to be a basketball player. And the mm. whole kind of theme of the movie is about sort of him accepting his family for what they want to be and learn, Aww. you know, working how how to be the best dad he can be and not necessarily just pressuring his kids to be obsessed <clears> with <throat> basketball all the time. Um, he goes in to have this... Um, this pitch where they pitch him this idea and he correctly says to the Warner Brothers um, studio people, this is a bad idea. <laughs> Please don't do this. Um, Don Cheadle is watching on a webcam and gets really upset because this algorithm has its own... Don, the algorithm gets really upset that LeBron James has like, dissed his idea. So mm. he um, responds by kidnapping LeBron James's son um, by like scanning him and bringing him into the digital world of the serververse. He brings LeBron James in as well. And then, he, and then he basically challenges, and there's no real reason for it, but he challenges LeBron James to a game of basketball, gives him a 24 hours to uh, get a team together, and then sends him off to Looney Tune World, where he meets Bugs Bunny, finds out that Bugs Bunny is the only Looney Tune remaining because uh, Don Cheadle's algorithm has convinced all the other Looney Tune characters to go and live in other film worlds. Mm. That's the setup of Space Jam. <laughs> Sounds great. I'm sure? confusing. <laughs> that was a bit, was a bit sarcastic. I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Like so much also, more complicated than the first one. Uh so much more complicated than the first like, one. And the it's first half one was an just, hour longer. Uh, okay, because the first one was just like some fun, and this one sounds just a little bit. Hmm. Yeah, well, let me get... What happens next is, when he gets sent to the Tunes world, he is turned into an animated character, and for the next 45 minutes of the film, I reckon, he is animated. LeBron James isn't acting on screen, there's just an animated version of it that he's voicing. So, when you said earlier about two hours of LeBron James, that's why I was a bit like, mm, not quite, because he then spends the rest... He's probably spent a day in the voice booth recording the voiceover lines for this portion of the movie, where him and Bugs Bunny basically steal Marvin the Martian spaceship and then travel around all of the other Warner Brothers serververse worlds, collecting the other Looney Tunes to form their base basketball team. So, for example, I mean, and this is so weird, Alex. That sounds Let's so think, lazy. I, I don't want to spoil it too much, <laughs> so I'll just give you one example, right? Yeah. You've seen, you've seen Mad Max for Fury Road, haven't you? Yeah. Right, so that's a world in the serververse, is the Mad Max world, right? Yeah. So Bugs Bunny and LeBron James go to the Mad Max world mm. where <laughs> Wiley Coyote and Roadrunner have moved to the Mad Max world. So there is a scene where you are watching a scene from Mad Max Fury Road of the big chase mm. and all the war boys, mm. but they have digitally inserted a cartoon of the Roadrunner into the scene and there is a scene in this children's film where the road where Riley Coyote sprays the silver drug thing that the war boys use in Mad Max into his mouth, holds up a sign that says "Witness me" on it, and then tries to jump down and kill himself with explosives, like in Mad Max, to get the road. <laughs> this happens in this movie. What? Were they, yes. Maybe they were trying. Were they trying to like entice? older people that I don't know they watched got, they watched um, uh, the first Space Jam where they were when they were our age kids are 
kids and now they're our age. And- but there's like, it's bonkers that there's no recent, I mean, because right, some of the other worlds they visit, I won't spoil who they find there and what scenes are shown and stuff, but that's a description of the kind of thing we get. And some of the other worlds they visit where they show scenes and digitally insert characters into them, the Matrix world. Mm. Aust- Austin Powers 2, the spy who shagged me. Okay. Casablanca. <laughs> okay. Game of Game of Thrones. Yeah. So they go to all these worlds. They collect all of the Looney Tunes characters. Then they train to be basketball players. Then, the, then about an hour into the film, there's an hour left. The actual basketball game starts. <laughs> it starts in Looney Tunes world, but the algorithm comes down and he kind of digitizes the whole world and changes it all into CGI. And at this point, LeBron James turns back into a human character. This is all in the trailers. This isn't. I know this happens an hour into the film. It sounds like I'm spoiling the whole film, but this is kind of all in the trailer. He turns all the Looney Tunes characters into like CGI models uh, rather than hand-drawn animation and they look horrific. <laughs> they look terrifying. Um, and then he beams in to fill up the, the, the crowds, to, to get a crowd going. He beams in characters from all over the Warner Brothers serververse. So half of the audience is made up of characters from Warner Brothers movies. So you've got like standing in a big crowd next to this basketball pitch, you've basketball court even <laughs> pitch. Um you've got like uh who have you got? You've got the mask okay. is is stood there. But it's not Jim Carrey obviously. It's just a guy dressed up as the mask. You got Pennywise the clown from it, but it's not um Bill Skarsgård. It's it's a guy dressed up as Pennywise the clown. You've got um the Joker from the 60s, you've got the Joker, Jack Nicholson's Joker, you've got Danny DeVito's Penguin, you've got uh, the White, the Night King from Game of Thrones, you've got, I mean, hundreds of characters, King Kong's there, the Iron Giant is there, like hundreds upon hundreds of characters. But most bizarrely, let me tell you about a film, I've spoken about this film before, do you remember me talking to you about The Devils by Ken Russell? Yeah. <clears throat> The film about it stars Oliver Reed and Vanessa Redgrave, and it's about a, like a 16th century French priest who is accused yeah, of yes, yes, possessing yes. all these nuns who are, yeah. who then have like these uh, like erotically mad orgies, and they were, it, it, Oliver Reed's character is accused of doing it. The the film is so controversial that Warner Brothers has always refused to release it uncut. Like it's impossible to watch this film it's in its original version, right? But. In the 2021 children's film, Space Jam, A New Legacy, very prominently throughout this entire basketball sequence, behind Don Cheadle's character is one of the erotically mad nuns from The Devils. Wow. Yeah. And she's like, she's like doing the thing that they do in The Devils, but obviously without context, you don't know what it is, but when you have the context of having seen The Devils, it's completely mad this is a film of a u rating not even a pg which means that like anyone should be able to watch it and anyone can watch it there's nothing offensive in it but it is bonkers that warner brothers continues to refuse to release this movie which is a classic masterpiece yet feels comfortable plopping characters from it into a um children's movie it's bizarre Sounds it's a bizarre movie weird <laughs> yeah it's really weird it's not a great film um it's nowhere like if we're being honest, the original Space Jam isn't a great film. It's just a film I have a lot of nostalgia attached to. I don't know if this movie is going to end up with this, this, people people who are young now watching it for the first time. It's so intent on trying to create this love, not for basketball, but for the Warner Brothers intellectual property. Mm. That I'm not sure if it's going to succeed as, as being kind of something that kids are going to... I don't know. Well, time will tell on that one. I don't think it's as successful as the original. But I had a fairly decently enjoyable time in the cinema just watching the kind of mad nonsense unfold. So, have yeah, you watched there we go. Uh, the original one in recent years? Because I haven't watched it. Yes, I've watched. Years. I've watched it over lockdown, and for me, it holds up because I just love it. Well, that's the thing. It's just like, do you think this will hold up? No, because it's too long. Like I, I, mm. like I was sat around with my housemate one afternoon in lockdown, and we just decided to watch Space Jam because it's like an hour and twenty five minutes long or something without the credits. This movie's like close to two hours, so it's not really a, it's not really for anyone. It's it's a strange I, beast. I feel of a sorry thing. for children <clears throat> this day and age because their films are so long. <laughs> yeah, their their attention <laughs> spans so are really being long. tested. Like once, but like our feel, our cartoons were like an hour and a half, an hour and twenty minutes, an hour and ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> They're like two and a half hours. 
Yeah, that's what I appreciate actually about Luca. Luca is like an hour and forty minutes on Disney Plus, but yeah. like fifteen minutes of that is credits. So the actual movie is like an hour twenty five minutes long. Yeah. That's the perfect length for a kids film. Luca does it right. Space yeah. Jam, no, not so much. Um, but yeah, there we go. That's Space Jam: A New Legacy. Just see it for the in for the madness, but it's not going to be. Um, I don't know. It's and the 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 soundtrack isn't what isn't what the original one was either. The soundtrack really, there was nothing in there that stood out to me. Was it Whereas like the original song, movie, like in the original one, that da 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 da. Yeah, I think that's in there a little bit. I think that might be. Is that like an actual NBA theme or something? But yeah, that that holds out. But like the original, it's got that song in the opening credits. The original film is like, come on and welcome to the jam. Da 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 da. Like it's such a good. But, but this film's got nothing like that in it. Anyway, moving on. I finally got to see a movie that I've been wanting to see for ages um, that, that ended up not being released in cinemas in the UK, but came to streaming platforms. So I, I brought it on Amazon Video uh, and watched it. And it is a 2021 film based on a Ubisoft video game that I'd never heard of until I until the film came out called Werewolves Within. Um, do you remember playing a party game in Japan, uh, called Werewolf, where everyone has to pretend to be a villager, and then one person is a werewolf, and you have to try and work out who the werewolf is. And after each round, if you've not found the werewolf, it kills one of the villagers, yeah, and then you... it rings a bell. <laughs> You're looking very unimpressed. Well, those games just confuse me. Uh, those games <laughs> where you know you're, you're something, and it's like what, and then you have to do certain things, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <clears throat> it's a it's a popular fun party game. Um, uh, there's obviously it's not for everyone necessarily, but it's a it's a popular party game. Ubisoft, the the kind of big French video game company, obviously at some point adapted it into a video game. I didn't know they'd done that called Wales Within, and that video game has now been adapted into a film. Although the video game apparently is set in medieval times, and this film is set in the present day, so it's very very loosely. Adapting <laughs> the, the game, <laughs> just the um, name. But I, the name is the yeah. same. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I think that's literally it. But ultimately, I don't think there's. I don't think there's anyone who has a lot of you know, kind of ownership. I don't know. I don't think there's big fans of the Werewolves Within video game that's, that are going to get upset about this. So um, I think it's okay. Anyway, this film is um, directed by Josh Rubin. I've not seen any of his films before. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, he directed it. Mission of Wolf, uh, wrote the screenplay and it stars, um, it's kind of an ensemble film, but it stars primarily Sam Richardson, who, um, you will know Alex as the host of the little buff boys competition. <laughs> yeah. And of the baby of the year competition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and I know yeah. as those things, and also uh, from an amazing uh, performance in Veep, uh, one of my favourite TV shows. Mm. So I'm a big Sam Richardson fan. Uh, so seeing him, seeing that he was starring in the movie was the reason why I wanted to watch this film. Um, he plays a kind of park ranger, forest ranger, who moves to a new town called Beaverfield um, to uh, well, look after the, the land there and look after the people. Um, he immediately befriends the local postman called Cecily, who is played by... Um, an actress called Milana Vaintrub, who is primarily what most well known for starring in a series of AT and T commercials in America, um, and apparently these are really popular TV commercials. Um, AT and T is like a mobile phone company, um, okay. uh, but she's very very good in this movie. So yeah, I'm glad to see her. Well, I think she's been in other stuff, but she's yeah, she's really really known as the AT and T girl for some reason. Um, and then it stars like a variety of other character actors who are all really, really good. Uh, you've got George Basil, Sarah Burns, Michael Chernus, Catherine Curtin, uh, Harvey Gwillen from uh, What We Do in the Shadows, the TV show, um, and a few other people. And basically, the idea with this movie is that um, after getting to this town and staying there for one night, suddenly all the generators are destroyed, the power goes out, uh, Sam Richardson's character goes to check on the... Um, generators and sees that they've all been slashed and in doing so he finds a dead body and uh, basically um, all the characters have to hide out together in the local inn and um, they discover or realise that amongst them is a werewolf and they have to work out who the werewolf is. Oh, like the card game. 
just like the game, exactly. So, you know, the film progresses with various characters being killed off. Um, but the kind of the thing that makes it a good movie is that this is more a comedy than a horror film. There's very little horror in this movie, mm. but there's a lot of comedy. Sam Richardson, it turns out, was one of the producers or executive producers. So he was able to bring his own sense of humour to his character, the main character. And he's really, really funny throughout the film. Um, if you've seen him in anything else, particularly Veep, uh, where he plays Richard Splatt, it's that exact kind of way of talking, way of performing and, and delivering lines that he does in that, that he brings to this film uh, that's really, really funny. Um, it does have a little bit of werewolf action in it, but if you go into it expecting like werewolves and loads of ac- that kind of stuff, you're probably going to be slightly disappointed. But if you go in expecting kind of a fun comedy that just happens to have a bit of a horror trapping to it, um, you'll probably enjoy it. I really, really liked it. I thought it was really funny, really good. Um, it's been dumped on like DVD, not even Blu-ray, uh, just DVD in the UK, and then dumped onto streaming services to rent. It'd be very, very easy to miss this film, but uh, it would be a big shame if Mm. you did because it's um, well worth pretty much anyone's time. If you just enjoy a fun, good comedy film, then um, I think you could get a lot out of this film. It's got, I looked it up, it's got a really good Rotten Tomatoes score, but it's got a terrible um, user reviews on IMDb. If you look for the user reviews Mm. on IMDb, it's just people ripping it apart. Um, And I think not really really being fair to it, just because... I think people go in expecting a werewolf film and when that isn't quite what it is, they get a bit disappointed. But it's like the game werewolf. You don't ever see the werewolf in it. You just talk about who is the werewolf and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd recommend people check it out. Okay, next up, um, my third of four films is the thriller, the new movie from M. Night Shyamalan. <laughs> that makes me laugh. <laughs> it's a good name. Shyamalan. He's a good. He's a good name. He's a Where good he director. Um, uh, M Night Shyamalan is Indian, I think. Mm. I believe. Nice name. Yeah, I like it. So he, um, I mean, we know generally we know M Night Shyamalan. He's the film auteur who enjoys to put twists at the end of his films. Um, so you've got The Sixth Sense, Unbreakable, The Village, Signs, The Visit. Um, After Earth, the Avatar film. I mean, he's done he's done plenty at this point. Split, Glass. I haven't seen any. His, of his latest. Have you not? Zero. Oh, they're 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 pretty. I I I would stand up for a few of them, particularly the Sixth Sense, uh, Unbreakable, and Signs are great films. Okay. Yeah, because I need yeah. to because like Split is in every list. It's really weird. Splits a good splits a splits a fun film. It was kind of his well, the visit was his return to form because he made these he made these twisty psychological thrillers in the um like the early noughties. Mm. and then when he got quite big, he started making trying to make blockbusters. He did a Will Smith, Jaden Smith film called After Earth, which everyone hated. He did a um an adaptation of the Avatar cartoon, which people really hated. <laughs> Um, and then he sort of disappeared for a little bit, and now and then he and then he obviously decided that he's happy doing the thing that he was originally known for, and he came back with this great found footage horror movie called The Visit, which is just brilliant. Mm. Um, and then he went even further back to what his his original style was split, and now old, this his latest he, he is really like a very classic M Night Shyamalan type of film. Um, Old is a movie starring Gail Garcia Bernal, Vicky Cripps, Rufus Sewell, Alex Wolfe, Thomasin McKenzie from Jojo Rabbit. Mm-hmm. Um, Abby Lee's in there. There's, there's, there's a few actors in it. And it basically follows this family, um, a husband and wife and a son and a daughter. The son is, I think, six and the daughter's about 11. Uh, they arrive in this resort that they've somehow booked very, very cheaply. Um, and uh, it's sort of revealed very early on that the husband and wife are going through marital difficulties and this is sort of their last big holiday uh, as a family before they mm. start to kind of make more serious choices about how they're going to move on as a as a couple kind of thing um at breakfast on the first morning the hotel resort manager comes up to them and says hey on the other side of the island is a secret <laughs> oh. cool natural beach surrounded oh. entirely by these huge rocks and it's gorgeous and I don't tell everyone about it I only tell special guests about it would you like to go to the special beach no. and they go that sounds <laughs> lovely thank you so much for inviting us to the special lovely beach well of course we'll go to the beach 
and he's like, okay, come along to the um to the coach and you'll get on and da da da. And they come to the coach and they get on and another family gets on um who are really unimpressed at the fact that they're not the only people going to the beach. Yeah, because they're well. supposed to be the only people. <laughs> yeah, and this other family, someone like he told us it was a special exclusive beach. Uh, but anyway, these two families go go on the beach. The coach driver turns up played by M. Night Shyamalan, because he can't resist putting himself in his own films. He's a real Hitchcock in that way. Um, and he drives them to the beach, he drops them off, he gives them two enormous hampers of food, and they're like, well, that's why are you giving us all this food? And he's like, oh, you've got children with you. Children need a lot of food, so take all this food. Uh, they walk through this kind of canyon, valley thing. They get to the beach, and uh, they're enjoying themselves on the beach, and then they realise, uh-oh, um... Bas- well, basically, through a, through a series of unfortunate events, they realise that um, they are being aged at a, an extremely fast rate while on this beach. And if they try to walk off the beach, they get this awful pounding pressure in their head and they pass out and wake up back on the beach. So they are an, unable to escape. And they basically work out that every half hour spent on the beach is a year in no. how much it ages them. Yeah. Wow. So they are, it's basically a race against time to try and work out how to get off this beach, how to deal with this problem. Um, obviously, the most interesting element of this is that the the adults kind of age by having wrinkles applied to them a little bit, etc. But the children age much faster, obviously. So the actors, the six-year-old and the 11-year-old are at one point swapped out and replaced by um, Alex Wolfe and Thomas and Mackenzie. Alex Wolfe being the son from Hereditary. Um who's a wonderful actor, and Thomas McKenzie being the um, incredible actress from Jojo Rabbit, who's appearing late this year in Last Night in Soho. Um, and basically, there's about there's about eight characters on the beach. There's the family of four, there's the other family of four, that's eight, and then two more people turn up a bit late, that's ten, and then there's a rapper who just happens to be there when they arrive for some reason, <laughs> so that's eleven. Don't question it, Alex. Um, so there's about eleven people on the beach. Um... All trying to work out how to get off the beach, um, all panicking about how fast they're aging, and um, it sort of it sort of progresses like that for the rest of the movie until eventually you know there is a final act and things are revealed and why is it all happening etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's a great idea for a film. It's a great setup for a film. Um, M Night Shyamalan makes movies like this for breakfast, and uh, it's I had a really good time watching it in the cinema, but I almost collapsed with laughter at certain points in the movie because it's not a comedy but it's got the most it's got the like and that Shyamalan is great at coming up with a good idea for film he's great at like directing his some of his camera shots in this movie are gorgeous and beautiful the way he moves his camera is unlike it kind of any other director there's 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 wonderful things he does in this film with moving back and forth along a scene and showing mm. how things are changing and it's just great but he can't write dialogue and he definitely can't direct actors and there's scenes in this movie where they have conversations like oh hey we're getting older but why aren't our nails and hair growing really fast oh that must be because the cells in hair and nails are already dead so they're not being affected by whatever's aging us ah yes you must be right it's like it's like it almost sounds like a badly translated anime dialogue or something it's perplexing so he writes the, the films as well yeah, he writes his movies. He loves to write his films. Um, wow. That's his whole thing. He's a he's a writer director. He's an author. Like he's like his films are his creations in the way that like Hitchcock's films or Hitchcock's films and James Cameron's. Like he's one of those types of directors who like it's his production. It's it's always sold as being an M Night Shyamalan movie. It's all his kind of idea and 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 scope and stuff. Um, and I I just feel like. The, it's it's a good film. I enjoyed it. It's not a good film. I enjoyed it, but it's bonk. It's, <laughs> it's bonkers. It's a good film. The, no, it's not a good film. It's, <laughs> it's got like the room level acting in it. It's it's crazy how bad some of the acting in it is. And I'm not blaming the actors. I'm like yeah. I feel like some of these actors must have given better takes, and for some reason he's chosen the takes where they sound like they're just screaming into a void. It's bizarre. <laughs> it's bizarre. But. I get similar to Space Jam. I kind of really had a good time watching it in the mm. cinema, but I was laughing at points where I probably wasn't supposed to be laughing. Um, 
Like, there's this very, like, the six-year-old boy at the start of the movie, before they've gone to the beach, is wandering around the resort, just walking up to people and going, hello, my name is Luke. Um, how old are you and what's your profession? And some, they'll go, oh, well, I'm 25 and I'm a policeman. And he'll go, okay, thank you. And then move on. it's just so strange. Uh, and then there's, a, there's like a twist at the end where it's like, you're meant to go, oh, that's why he was asking them what they did for a living. And, and it's like, no, it's just silly. It's just really <laughs> silly and weird. But, um, but again, similar, similar, to, similar to Space Jam, check it out. Go and see it and make your mind up because it's 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 fascinating movie. Right, final film I'm going to talk about is a 2021 um, science fiction action film uh, directed by Chris McKay, who previously directed... Um, the Lego Batman movie, so um, an animation director making the jump to live action, which Ooh. is actually also something I'm going to be discussing with one of my top five films later in the episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, this is a movie that stars Chris Pratt and also the wonderful and perfect Sam Richardson <laughs> from hosting Little Buff Boys competitions, <laughs> Baby the Year competitions. <laughs> Finding Werewolves, now <laughs> starring alongside Chris Pratt in oh sci-fi God, movies. I love Sam Richardson. This. The guy is, he's so good. He's so good. I hope he gets, you know, the recognition he deserves. Um, along with Yvonne Strahovski, who plays the um, the sort of the wife character in The Handmaid's Tale. Uh, and I've only ever really seen her in The Handmaid's Tale before, but she's, she's, she's great in this film. Um, and J.K. Simmons, who's great in everything. Yeah, he ever does. He's very so, busy at the moment. Good. I see him everywhere. <laughs> He's crazy busy. <laughs> like it's bizarre everything. how busy this man is. Um, so this is a film. Yeah, it's got a great cast. It's um, it was made by I think Paramount Studios made it uh, to be released theatrically, but then when the pandemic hit, obviously it wasn't released theatrically, and they ended up selling the film instead to Amazon Video so that Amazon could put it on Prime as like a Prime film. Mm. Um, just just guess, Alex, just out of interest. How much do you reckon they sold this film to Amazon for? It has to be in the millions. Uh, okay. Let's go... $20 million. Amazon paid $200 million for this film. Oh, yeah, twenty million dollars is nothing, is it? <laughs> no, it's very low. <laughs> Two hundred. Oh God, I'm so um, I'm so scared. Like twenty million dollars. I could have just said twenty pounds, and it would have been the same. Two hundred thousand um, dollars. No, nope, that's two hundred million. <laughs> <laughs> that's the price of the house. They paid twenty dollars for the film. Two hundred million dollars. Perfect. Yeah, which I, I think was the bud. Uh, well, according to Wikipedia, which isn't necessarily the most reliable source, but that it, Wikipedia says that that was the budget of the movie. So I guess Amazon sort of covered the costs of making the film to have it then be an, an Amazon Prime movie. That's fantastic. The plot of this though. film. Why is it fantastic? Well, you pay everybody. No. Yeah. No, yeah, I guess everybody like, gets paid. I guess, like, you, you broke even. Yeah, sure. Paramount broke even. Yeah, and then Amazon are hoping to... But I, don't, I mean, I, how the model works for streaming services, who, like, Amazon have put this up free for Prime subscribers now. Will it will it generate more Prime accounts? I don't know quite how they... I don't the know how is, they make... Everybody put a value has on. got a Prime account. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, so it's... I don't know quite how it's going to... Um, I guess the idea is, but it ke- they want to keep people as well, so they they want they want people to know that there's more content coming in the future, so they don't get rid of their Prime account. I don't know. Anyway, the point is, Amazon have done this. It's a Prime Video movie. Um, let me let me give you the sub of the movie, Alex. Stop me when you get confused, okay? <laughs> That's gonna be very soon. This is <laughs> this is a film set in 2022, okay? Um, Chris Pratt is a geography is a no, he's a bio- high school biology teacher. Oh, 2022 hasn't happened yet. No, I know. Bear with me. <laughs> Bear with me. Sorry, sorry. Okay. Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt is a high school biology teacher. He's a sad dad because he wants to be a scientist man, but the science lab won't hire him. They hire somebody else, so he kicks his bin over and is all sad. He goes back into um, his house where there is a party for some reason. <laughs> his wife... Uh, played by Betty Gilpin, who is the lead character in The Hunt, a movie I hated, but she's perfectly serviceable here. Although she does, she doesn't do much, um, but she's a, she's a good actress. She's she's good in The Hunt. I just don't like the movie. Anyway, his wife his wife tells him to uh, play spend some time with his daughter, 
Um, but he's too busy being sad and focusing on it, on his sadness from not being allowed to be a science man. So he sits down with his daughter, and this is why I know it's set in 2022, to watch uh, a match of the 2022 Qatar World Cup. So he's watching a football <laughs> match on TV with his daughter. All of a sudden, mm -hmm. a giant portal Wait. wormhole thing opens up above the pitch and a bunch of shot, bunch of soldiers just fall out of it. Mm -hmm. And one of the soldiers looks at a TV camera and explains to the world who are watching, everyone's watching the Football World Cup, of course, explains to the world that in 50 years, aliens are going to invade the planet and just decimate humanity. And at that point, in 50 years' time, there are only 500,000 humans left living on the planet, which is obviously not as many as we have today. That wouldn't be too so, bad. So... The world, you know... No. <laughs> I mean, it's it's over it's overrun by these terrifying, like, giant white dog alien things, but okay. sure. Um, so, the idea... So, they've come back in time. They've, they've invented time travel. Don't worry about it. They've invented time travel. Don't think about it. But they've invented time travel. <laughs> no, I would. I they've would. come. You told me stop me when you when I get confused. Like, should I stop you? <laughs> no, don't stop me yet. Okay. <laughs> Are you confused? <laughs> yeah. Well, I did. you never said they would look? They would look like dogs. Oh well, the aliens. Yeah, but you don't see the aliens until later in the movie. But okay. The, alien, okay, the aliens do, but this this is a human soldier that's come back in time, right? The humans have invented time travel, and I said fifty years. I think it's actually thirty years. Sorry, okay. thirty years in the future. So, thirty years in the future, they've come back in time. Now, bear with me. <laughs> to, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> to ask, no, to get right. They've come back in time to get their. People from 2022 mm -hmm. to go into 30 years into the future to fight as soldiers in the war that is happening there. Do you get me? So they come, they've arrived in the, in the present, like 2022, yes. to yes. recruit people to yes. fight the aliens in the future. Yes. yes. Because there are not enough people in the future because there, there are about 500,000. Yes. Ah, oh, perfect. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So they were, and so, I f and the general idea is that um, you can only be recruited mm -hmm. to go and fight in the Tomorrow War if at that point, 30 years in the future, you would have already died. Okay. Right? Okay. But is that, is that, <laughs> so, is that, is that not going to mess around the future? Why? Well, like, if you think about time travel, like, I've already died there, yeah? So I'm going to yeah. go there, but I haven't already arrived yeah. there because I'm time traveling. But yeah. then I die. I die in the tomorrow war. Then that yeah. means that I'm not going to be... Like, we're going to change time and everything, aren't we? Well, I think this movie this movie kind of goes off the time... Not because a, a, a popular type of time travel, like the type of time travel Back to the Future uses, is that if you change something in the past, it will change the future. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Or what... and then But then Back to the Future Part 2 introduces this idea, and I think this is what this film uses, is the idea that you're essentially creating multiple parallel timelines. Oh, like Loki. Or like Loki, exactly. Right, yeah. So... <laughs> I've confused myself, but but yeah. So, <laughs> what are we doing for the have for the people the in the future? <laughs> for the people in the future, yeah. Chris Pratt's character has died, right? Already, they've seen him die because he dies before he comes. But then he, t when he turns up in the future, him that's like almost creating a different timeline because now he's in the future, I suppose. They describe their time travel technology as being like. Time is a river moving yeah. in a, inexorably forward. You can't reverse the flow of the river, right? What they've done mm. is they've created a raft in 2022 and a raft in 2052. Mm -hmm. And you can hop between those two rafts, but those two rafts are always going to be moving down the river, right? So if you go into the future for a week, when you go back to the past, it will be a week later in the present. Does that make sense? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, 
Chris Pratt and... So Chris Pratt gets recruited to go into the future to fight in this war. The idea being that you go for a week and if after a week you're still alive, you get you get transported back to your present, right? But only 30% of people make it back. So the world is kind of going crazy with worry about how awful this war is and everyone's dying and what's going to... You know, it creates this whole psychological effect of like... That's not explored that much in the movie, but it's mentioned a little bit of like, what is the point of, of studying or trying or doing anything if you know that in 30 years the world's going to end? Mm-hmm. Which is a, tr- a tricky one. So Chris Pratt gets recruited to go into the future to fight in the future. Um, oh, God. <laughs> Along with um, a bunch of other people. Uh, primarily, he makes friends with Sam Richardson, who plays um, you know another guy who gets recruited. They go into the future. They have a few fights and battles, etc., etc. He meets um, a character there, played by Von uh, called uh, who's a colonel. Mm-hmm. Um She's an important character, but I don't want to say too much about uh, why she's an important character, but she's she's really good in the film, actually. Uh, they have a few adventures together. They try and discover a way of, like, stopping all of this happening and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, the, they win at the end because it's a big action film. The plot makes absolute... Like, this film came out and got such terrible reviews. Um, and that part of the, the plot doesn't make any sense. Like, if you think about it for a second, it just falls apart. It's so bonkers. Yeah. But, but, it's a huge budget action sci-fi movie. Mm. And the action sequences are directed extremely well. They're mm. really tense. The monsters are, I think, a really great design. They're like these huge white dog-looking things, but they have these two tentacles that come off their back and shoot spikes at people. Like, they're scary-looking beasts. Um... The fight, these fight sequences where they're fighting these monsters are really, really fun and exciting to watch. It all feels a bit Independence Day at times. Mm. And I really enjoyed the aspects of the film. It's two hours and 20 minutes long, which is way, way, way too long. Um, it has an entire third act that just makes no sense and doesn't, I don't know, just is bonkers, doesn't necessarily need to be there. The movie could end much earlier, I think, and, and still be a good film. They could almost make a sequel where they do the stuff that's in the third act. Um... Chris Pratt, he gets on my nerves in the real world, but he is a he is a serviceable, charming leading man in films like this. I think Sam Richardson is very funny, doing his thing. Um, J.K. Simmons is is great in it. Von Strahovski is great in it. I think people have been a bit, bit unfair on it. I mm. I gave it three and a half out of five on Letterboxd. I thought it was a solid, fun film. It falls apart if you think about it too much, but if you just go in for a good time and just just relax and ha- and enjoy yourself. I think it's pretty fun and I, I liked it and I would recommend people to check it out and just have an open mind about it and just watch it if they want something that they can enjoy. And I think they'll they'll get some fun out of it and everyone should just lighten up, dudes, and maybe we'll have a good time. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, hmm. yeah. I'm trying to find the, the dog aliens, but I can't find them. Yeah, they're not, they're not really in the trailers. There's not been much... Um, like, ah, they've got lots of arms. Well, they have, yeah, they've got like arms and legs and then these tentacles and stuff. So they're yeah, kind of like... Yeah, awesome. They're pretty cool. I think they look good. I think they're cool. Um, yeah. If, it looks a bit like a bit a of a kind of Independence Day kind of vibe, the the look. Definitely. It's like, it's it looks like something the alien from Independence Day would have as a pet. <laughs> Come on, Bronco, yeah. let's go. <laughs> Come on. Um, there's just okay. a few, like, uh, uh, there's a choice that's, uh, I can't, I can't talk about it in detail because it's a big spoiler, but there's a choice that Chris Pratt's character makes about an hour and a half into the film that I hate it so much. Like there's some really crazy, um, character decisions and stuff in this movie that just make no sense. But again, if you can just relax and have a good time, you might enjoy it. It takes, it steals liberally from films like Independence Day. Uh, the Thing is in there quite a lot. Um, what was the other movie that it really seems to sort of, um, be inspired by I can't remember what it was now it's like the thing crossed with something else mm. it doesn't really matter um, but yeah it's, it's bonkers but I kind of had a good time with it um, so yeah that's all my films uh, for today the only one the only thing left to talk about is I did have a couple of listens to the new uh, Dave album We're All Alone In This Together did you have a chance to check this out at all? is it out? oh, oh yeah it came out last week okay no I haven't <laughs> Talk to me. Well, I won't talk about it in too much detail because I'm sure you'll listen to it. We can have a longer discussion. But um, I've listened to it about three or four times and early impressions are really, really good. It seems to me like he's created another masterpiece. 
um, that is a bit broader in scope than the first album, Psychodrama. It kind of looks a, a wider... It's kind of him. The first album felt very personal. Mm. This album feels a bit more kind of looking outwards at the world and, and seeing what he finds. Um, I think the title is gorgeous. We're all alone in this together. Apparently it's something Hans Zimmer said to him on a, on a Zoom call. Uh, the, the artwork is absolutely beautiful and um, there are some really, really great tracks on it. So you should uh, give it a listen and we, we can talk about it another week in more detail. But uh, yeah, it's good. It's good. And oh. he's got that he's, he's got that melancholy piano going on nice. that I love. Uh, there's a James Blake song on there and also the opening track um, plays a very similar trick to the opening track of Psychodrama, um, but uh, in a way that I like. So, yeah, we can talk about it more in the future, but um, yes, it's good. Yes, please, I'm going to listen to it. I've just been listening to so many kind of like, you know, Spotify does just gives me random choices now, so I have nothing <laughs> that is... <laughs> um, but yeah, that's all. I'll tell you what I'm not going to be talking to you about today, and that's Donda. Is it out? No, it's not out until the sixth of August now. Apparently, okay. Yeah, because it's just all a. Uh, did he, did he not do something? Did he hire a stadium and people paid loads of money to hear it, his songs played, recorded like re- recorded? He did a he did a big like um album listening party at like the Mercedes Benz Stadium in I think it's in Los Angeles. Yeah, and um the idea was the album was going to come out after that party, but it didn't come out. It he. Apparently has decided it's not finished yet, so he has created a living space in the stadium and created a studio in the stadium, and he's now living in the stadium, finishing this album. Um, and there's various like Instagram photos and videos of him walking out and watching a football game for a few minutes, um, uh, and with a with a pair of tights over his head. He's yeah, he's not he's still not a well man, I don't think. I'm 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 amazed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm it's the I'm least really interest am, like it's just I don't know it's the least interest I've been for a project by him in a very very long time so um yeah it's Kanye West if you're listening and you don't know what we're talking about it's the new Kanye West album <laughs> yeah, Bunda, which we didn't is even say the name <laughs> supposed to be out but isn't out and who knows if it'll ever come out um I don't know I don't know I've lost a lot of time for that man so yeah. I'll just wait and see what the album's like, if he has anything to say that changes my opinion on him. Mm. How about you, Alex? How's your culture catch-up going? Oh, well, um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, series and uh, a couple of films today. Uh, so I, well, the one of the series I'm going to talk really quickly, uh, I finished uh, the fourth season of Working Mums. Oh, yeah, I haven't finished that yet. How was it? Um... It's, uh, it got, you know, we talked about it a few weeks ago and I just started it and I didn't feel the same, but I, it's, it's good. It, it, uh, it improved and I would recommend any, if you haven't watched any of the seasons, start watching it from the first one because I think it's a really good, uh, series and it's not as good as it used to be, like I said before, but, um, I think it held up, this season held up as well. And this is the fifth season and... A lot is there going to be more? Does it end in a way where it feels like there'll be, be more? I think there's going to be of... more. I think there's going to be right. more. But what I like about this series is just it changes a lot. Like it's never the same. Like the settings change. The kids are changing. Um, their lives are changing. They're moving houses. They're changing jobs. It's, it's, a, it's a constant evolving uh, life. And I think that's why I really enjoy it because it's not, is not the same and I think maybe that's why the fifth season doesn't feel I don't I maybe I don't I, I don't like it as much as I used to but because the, their life has completely changed um yeah. one of the characters has moved to a different town Frankie the she's um estate agent and she goes through like uh, in, in in every series she goes she's like she's either amazed she goes through depression and then she goes through success and in this there's a tragedy happening and so it's is an evolving yeah. tv series and the characters change constantly like hum, humans change and i think that's why i i mean i really enjoy it yeah, um, I like that about it. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. And uh, yeah, I hope there's going to be a sixth season because I really, I really, really like it. And then um, <laughs> I'm watching a um, Japanese uh, TV series called uh, The Naked Director. 
season number two is out. Uh, the Nick director is a uh, uh, Netflix, a Japanese Netflix se- series uh, about. Um, it's kind of like a semi biographical um, series about um, porn um, director Masaharu Take. Uh, and uh, it's um, and it's about him and about uh, the the change in pornography in uh, uh, Japan. Um, it's really interesting because it kind of shows the 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 evolution of pornography in Japan and how we know. Well, um, I don't know if anybody of our listeners know, but um, in Japan, pornography is censored. Uh, the act. The actual act is all censored and um, apparently this director wanted things to uh, change and make it uh, real because a lot of times they weren't even having sex and he wanted to like make it uh, bigger and bigger. Uh, I'm not sure how much is true and how much is not true because, you know, um, some things are true. He used to live with all of his actresses and uh, he apparently had relations with a lot of them. Uh, He kind of brought uh, (laughs) pornography to the forefront and kind of made it maybe less underground. Um, but uh, the first season um, focuses on him becoming a porn director and him becoming a very successful porn director uh, and his uh, weird methods of making films. He wanted to make exciting films, but like action porn films with a story. That's what he, what he wanted. And so um, the first season is about his rise into uh, pornography stardom and finding um, this um, new actress um, called Kaoru Kuroki, who is apparently is really famous porn actress in Japan but she's like a celebrity and so that's the first season and it it, it it's good and then the second season he has um become this porn director now his aim is to bring porn to every house through satellite <laughs> right <laughs> And it's just in the second season, he just that's his uh, main goal. He buys this massive mansion where all his actresses live. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of is the second season is much more intense, much more violent and much more sexual. There's a lot of sex in the second season, which is bizarre because it's in in, in Japanese drama and comedy. It's very rare that you even see the actors kissing. Yeah. But in this series, <laughs> you see everything. Like, there's some scenes that you go, this could be pornography. Like, <laughs> there are actual scenes where I, I watched an episode last night and I was like, like, if the angle was slightly different, it would have been like it was weird um and so it, it it's 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 a series that's pushing boundaries in Japan uh because yeah. a lot of people are watching it but also a lot of people go oh well you can't and uh, the actors which um um uh, actors in Japan are called they call them talents and yeah. they are they have to uh, they have to be a certain way and they have to act in a certain manner and they can't really, um, you know, they're, they're held to a different standard than normal humans. So if you're an actor that maybe has just smoked a joint, you're going to be cancelled. Like in Japan, it's like that. And or if yeah. you're an actor, or especially if you're a woman, um, there was this talent uh, who... Um, who had an affair with a married man and she totally got cancelled. Uh, the man didn't, but the woman did. And so it's it's a society where uh, the actors, talents, personalities get, uh, get you know, um, judged in a different way. And so there are a few actors here that have been actors for a long time and have been in the hearts of everyone. And the main actor, um, Takayuki yeah. uh, Yamada, 
which plays the um, Toru Muranishi. In, um, he, um, the actual porn director, uh, Masaharu Take, told him that if he wanted to keep, you know, if you if he did if he wanted to keep this high status, he maybe shouldn't do this because he he was like they're not gonna consider you for any other role, and uh, he said no, I want to do it. It's important that we do these things, and so you know, I, even even the the porn director said if you, <laughs> you shouldn't do it because you're not gonna be considered anymore. And then in the second season, there's this actress that has been in the Jap the the hearts of the Japanese since she was a baby, and she is very naked, and uh, and in Japan people were a bit like, oh no. <laughs> don't do that and but she she wanted to you know do something different and uh, i think i think i think it's good um it's funny it's interesting i'm not sure how real it is some things are real some things are not real uh yeah. but it's it's a fun series and i think it's a re- definitely a good watch um the naked director and um I, I, the second season has finished i'm not sure if they're going to do another season uh, i think they've uh, pushed the boundaries a little bit too much in uh, <laughs> in japan <laughs> pushed various <Fair enough>. <laughs> yeah uh yeah uh, so um yeah that's the naked director and then i watched a couple of films i watched uh 2019 uh, british uh, black comedy get Duked, which stars Eddie Izzard, James Cosmo. Do you know him? Yes. Yes, love him. I think he's a uh, great. And then uh, Ali Slow is in it for like three minutes. Yes, please, I love uh, Ali Slow. I really, yes. And then the main characters are played by Samuel Bottomley, Viraj Junega, Ryan. Gordon and Louis Gribbon, which are all uh, young actors. Uh, Louis Gribbon was in Train Spotting Two T Two. <laughs> These uh, three uh, three teenagers uh, who uh, have uh, you know they've uh, blew uh, blown up a toilet, and so uh, the school um, the head uh, head teacher um, tells them that they have to do this uh, Duke of Edinburgh award. If you don't know what the Duke of Edinburgh Award is, this uh, thing where you spend four days walking in the wilderness in Wales, which is crazy. It seems like, how can you put teenagers in the wilderness? I don't know. Not um, necessarily in Wales, though. Uh, not, it's not necessarily in Wales. Somewhere. It be, it's wherever's reasonable for where your school is going. Kind of uh, okay, somewhere in the wilderness. Uh, and in this case, is in the Highlands. Oh, yes, Scotland. What am I talking about? Yeah, in Scotland. I don't know why Thursday kids in Wales. <laughs> um, and uh, so uh, they, um, these uh, three guys, uh, three kids that have um, misbehaving kids, have to are on um, have to do this. And then um, another kid joins them, a homeschooled kid that he wants to do it because uh, it's it looks good in the CV. So there's three kids that don't want to do it and one kid that really wants to do it and uh they don't they don't have anything in common uh but uh what they have to do is try uh, to finish this uh duke of edinburgh and um in the first and they have to reach i think you have to reach the camps what well, you have to reach the campsite uh, in the middle uh before it's dark uh but they start <laughs> getting stalked by these uh these people who they think one of them could be the duke of edinburgh uh because it's got like a shotgun <laughs> right. and uh they um and this person that they that an old lady that they might think is like the queen and uh they uh, these two uh, aristocrats uh try to kill them so it's about these four kids trying to uh escape being killed by uh these two with the shotguns in the highlands in uh Scotland um it's it's a really <laughs> it's a really silly film uh but really really fun like there's these four teenagers and they um they are kind of lost uh they kind of uh the losers of the school and uh they um i don't know they kind of redeem themselves 
with this Duke of Edinburgh by the end. Uh, but before getting to the end, uh, so people get hit by a minibus. Uh, they eat some uh, uh, animal droppings that make make you trip. Uh, they uh, they meet some farmers. Um, and uh, and then there's a really in- amazing monologue at the end about um, kids at the moment not being able to achieve their dreams and adults saying, well, why don't you just work, work harder and how hard it is now to be able to have like the minimum. And I thought that was good. Yeah. It's like a funny, silly film with like a... a, a deeper meaning at the end and i i really i really enjoyed it because like the 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 people that's trying to kill them are part of like a big community of uh kind of wealthy country people that uh say that these kids are good for nothing and uh they are like the the cancer of society and it kind of felt in a way like how society is treating kids at the moment. And I thought mm. it was really like, it's a funny comedy with like a twist of uh, real- realism in it. And uh, no, was, I, I was pleasantly surprised because um, this kept popping up on Amazon Prime and it was the first thing that came up. This is what we recommend for you. And so I thought oh, I'll give it I'll give it a go. And then I watched an a film, another 2019 film called Villains. And that's mm. another black comedy. So I watched two black comedies. Uh, kind of similar actually. Like kind of killing spree, funny moments, ending in weird times. Um uh, and that has got finally I managed to watch something with a scars guard. It's that stars, <laughs> uh, that stars Bill Skarsgård. Because <laughs> you talk to, do you talk about him all the time? I want to talk to about him sometimes. Yeah, well, there's loads of the Stellan, there's Alexander. Bill's a good one. Is he? Bill's is he related? They're all yeah. Stellan's the dad, and then Alexander and Bill are the children. And there's another Skarsgård as well. Yeah, I can't remember his name. There's a there's, there's a ton of them. <laughs> <laughs> so there is it stars uh Bill Skarsgård, um Micah Monroe. Oh, I love her. Absolutely adore her. Which I think I've not seen her in anything else apart from this film. She's great. I've not and seen that film, I, but I've seen I'm in films. love with her. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Ah. And then um Jeffrey Donovan and Kyra Cedric. That's a good cast. Yeah, it's an amazing cast. And uh, so um, <laughs> uh, so this is a, it's a, it's about uh, this uh, kind of amateur criminals. Uh, I think the first scene is really fun. It starts with them talking, but you don't see them. And they're trying to figure out what costume they should wear. And then they it starts with them trying to rob this convenience store. Right, <laughs> it's just so funny. Like the beginning, the beginning is just really surreal because they talk about the cost. I want to wear the pigeon. I want to wear the horse. And then they rob this, um, this convenience store. And it's just, it's just funny how they do it. And um, they need to open the till, and they open the till in a funny way, um, and kind of, kind of that you know they're just not criminals. They're just two kids that. Uh, robbing things and their aim is to reach florida and from the beginning you fig you realize how much love is between them they're really in love but they kind of respect and love each other and uh so uh, they managed to rob this convenience store and then they um they drive away but then they realize that they don't have any petrol in the car and so they there's a house nearby and they break into the house and um to find the keys of the car or some gas and um and there's funny moments in there where to they just do really silly things and then they go downstairs and they find a girl in the basement uh i th- i don't think i'm 
spoiling it. I think that's in the trailer. That's so. it. I've I've only ever seen the trailer for this film, and that's definitely in the trailer. Yeah, and then uh, so there's a girl in the basement, and they try to figure out how to get her out of the basement. But before they figure it out, the owners of the house uh, come back, and the owners of the house are not normal. <laughs> They're not really normal. There's something. The more you find out about them, the more sinister they become. And um, then uh, the main characters, Mickey and Jules, um, they get uh, kind of kidnapped by them. Uh, and it's the story of Mickey and Jules trying to escape from this couple who are weird and uh and is all set in this house and uh and well try to escape and save the girl which and we're not really sure if she wants to be saved right uh, and then uh yeah and that's uh, that's the film um it's it starts really funny so it's a dark comedy that starts with like funny <clears throat> and then yeah. It's just basically like going downhill. <laughs> the bit, the but the first bit is hilarious, and then, but it's not, it's not, it's not diminishing. Like it's kind of like funny, funny, not so funny, and then at the end you go, oh, you don't expect <laughs> the end. And um, I really enjoyed it actually. Um, there's uh, it's kind of creepy and the the, the bill uh, no jeffrey donovan and Kara sedgwick are amazing in it super creepy um the michael monroe is really amazing to watch uh and i really enjoyed it it's a really <coughs> fun tragic black comedy and um definitely a, a recommendation yeah, is that the film that you said that you would wasn't expecting me to watch? Yeah, I saw it pop up on Letterboxd that you'd watched it, and I was like, "Wow, that's <laughs> that looks like an intense movie for Alex to be checking out." It's been on my watch list for ages, but I've never kind of watched it. I think you should watch it. I think it's no, I it's not as scary to. as it. it's not as scary as as you might think it would be, but it is. It is. It's creepy. Yeah. If you really liked Mike and Monroe, two other movies you should check out are The Guest and It Follows. No, I'm not never going to watch something called The Guest. And I'm never going to watch something to say It Follows. What follows? I don't want to know. Well, it does. It the guest, follows. You, you, what, the Guest you could watch. Why wouldn't you watch something called The Guest? The Guest of what? Who's the guest of who? Which guest? You'll find out when you watch the film. Exactly. That's not, that's not an inherently sinister idea. It is. <laughs> it is. Guest. Is it not? The guest. It's like anyway. Well, it's like a it's like a Terminator sort of homage. So it's not scary. It's it's like a kind of an action. Um, Who's the guest? Budget where is action. the guest? Dan Stevens is the guest. Okay. But where is the guest? Inside of whom? You're, inside of who? Yeah. What are you talking about? This, you know, the guest, the Blair Witch Project, the Conjuring. The Incredibles, <laughs> The Crudes. I guess. But, <laughs> the never um, ending story. <laughs> but I really, I really loved Jeffrey Donovan in this one. Mm. I think he's a really good actor. He really looks like James Franco in the trailers. It's I always, whenever I see the trailer for villains, I always think it's James Franco until I realise it's um, Jeffrey Donovan. And yeah, I'm getting better at, you know, creepy films. Well yeah. done. Good job. Yeah. Danke. And uh, that is it for my culture catch-up. I've been at an Italian wedding and I spent three days uh, not watching anything. <laughs> <laughs> that's absolutely fair. Fine. Um, that's like fair. A mini, yeah. So, yeah. so let's move on. Uh, homework is a bit different this week because our homework from last episode was to read a couple of books uh, and we're going to do a big update on that when we finish them uh, near the end of the summer. Um, but how are you getting on so far with your assignment of bad science, Alex? Great. I looked yeah. at um, the cover. Nice. It was very good cover. Yeah, that's good. That's a good start. I am... Um... <laughs> 
Well, I'm reading the five, um, the untold story of the untold stories of the um, victims of Jack the Ripper, and uh, so far I have looked at the cover and downloaded it to my Kindle. Bought it on Amazon and downloaded it to my Kindle. So I'm slightly ahead of you, but not by much. No, let's see. <laughs> but maybe we can, uh, if we each read a chap a chapter before yeah, next you, week. I'm we going to have uh, a chapter ready for next week. That's cool. And so will yeah. I. So we can talk about that next week a little bit. Um, but that gives us a bit of time to maybe do a MyTube. You're you're stood in a you're stood in a in a dark hallway, yeah. No. Yes, and there are three no. doors. There are three doors yeah. in front of you. Okay, mm. and each door has a label. The first door says the label says um, funny meme. Mm-hmm. The second door, the label says nostalgia, mm-hmm. and the third door, the label says intense. Which door are you going to open? Funny meme. Funny meme, okay. You might have seen this. If you've seen this, we'll just do it again and you can choose a different door. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take um, two. But I saw this the other day. This popped up somewhere and it's, it's just very weird and it made me laugh. So um, see what you think of this. I'm going to send it to you on Facebook and then we can start it at the same time. You ready to press play? Yeah. Okay. In three, so I'm watching two. something called Slap Chop. I've never Slap seen chop. it, by the way. Okay, cool. Right, so three, two, one, go. Hi, it's Fitz with Slap Chop. You're going to be in a great mood all day because you're going to be slapping your troubles away with the Slap Chop. This tuna looks boring. Stop having a boring tuna. Stop having a boring tuna. <laughs> this life. guy is just like cutting boring. stuff one with his Slap Chop. You're going to have an exciting life now. Breakfast to go. An exciting life. Watch this. It's worthless. Forget about it. <laughs> he just threw it. something in the pink. Right, this is making you cry and making me cry. Life's hard enough as it is. Is this real? The skin's at the bottom. And watch this. Tacos, fettuccine, linguine, martini, bikini. Here's how to order. Okay. What? So, what did you just watch, Alex? I just watched this guy with this incredible machine that you could, like, press it and it would just chop everything up. So it's like a little plunger thing chop. that you put over food yeah. and you slap it and it yeah. chops it up all fine for you. Yeah. And then if you bought it, then you would get this grating thing and you would grate your f- the thing. I kind of want it though. Is that real? I want it. Well, that I'll, t- I'll talk to you about whether it's real or not in a minute, but like what what makes it an interesting video <laughs> beyond just the product itself? Like the guy is like, <laughs> oh, and, you're, and then he just like gets another thing and he chucks it in the, in the, at the back. <laughs> And he gets a worthless one that doesn't open up like the slap chop does and he throws yeah. it behind him and it lands perfectly yeah. in the sink. Um, yeah. He's one of the most intense uh, salesmen I've ever seen. Is he real? And, well, he very successfully sells you on wanting a slap chop, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. So I went on, I was like, is that real? Because the video is so strange and funny that I was like, is this an actual real product? And I went on Amazon and I looked it up and you can buy it on Amazon. It's a real thing. And it's got a lot of terrible reviews. No. <laughs> Because apparently, and this totally makes sense, apparently you slap it to chop something and then it gets chopped and then when the when the knife blades go back up, it just pulls the food back up and then it's all of stuck course. within the plate. Of and course. then you've got to dig the stuff out of these blades, slicing your fingers up, and it's just a dangerous, bad product, it sounds like. I was just like, I according at least laptop. According to the Amazon reviews. So I was just interested that they stay... I just thought it was funny they sell it so well. Uh, maybe they've... Um, lubricated the blades in some way but apparently there's all these photos on the amazon reviews of it with food all stuck in it and stuff and i was like it's like the expectations versus reality meme um come to definitely. life definitely 
Yeah. So I don't know, that just made me laugh in bed the other morning when I woke up and it popped up on my YouTube, so I thought I'd share it. Um, you can see it for yourself in the link below on the show notes. Amazing. Yeah. Five, four, three, two, one, our top five. This was a really hard list Ugh. because, um, like, I don't know. I don't know if I did the right thing, but I took, I didn't put any Koreeda films. Okay. <laughs> I didn't put any Wes Anderson films. Okay. <laughs> I didn't put any Quentin Tarantino films. Okay. Like, I feel that maybe I could talk about those films. Like, we know I I love Korea. Like, I don't know. I just No, I took a so similar tack to you. I didn't. I sort of left out anything that we've talked about in detail before. Um, yeah. With maybe one exception, but it's not really been in a list before. We've just ended up talking about it a lot. But, um... I've got, I've yeah. got a couple of films that maybe we already talked about, but not in a list. But, for example... I love Koreeda, so I could put a few films of his in my list. And I love Wes Anderson, and I can put some of his films. But maybe we should do a, like a Wes Anderson top five. Episode at some point, yeah. yeah. Well, I feel similarly about uh, Ben Wheatley. I was very nearly put a Ben Wheatley movie in, and I was like, you know what, we've talked a lot about Ben Wheatley recently. I nearly put a Ben Wheatley film, film in. Like, oh, oh. It's, such a, it's such a good decade, though. I think. Oh, I, think is- I think we should just stop the episode now and say <laughs> the tw- the the tens were a good decade everything is good i mean i i have um on my letterbox you can well on anyone's letterbox you can uh organize all the films you've ever watched by year so i just went through every year from 2010 to 2019 and wrote down each film that could potentially be in my top five and at the end it was well over 100 films it took me yeah. so i was just staring at this list of movies for ages and ages um, and had to start whittling it down to five. And yeah. there are five movies I love, but there are so many more movies I love in this decade. I mean, and it, I mean I'm sure it's not because it's the best decade of all time, but it's such a recent decade. I've, yeah. I've just seen so many films from it. I have so many memories attached to the films from this from this past decade that um, mm. it was tough. It was really tough. But I've got it yeah, to a point I that I'm vaguely happy. I think I tried to also happy. get different, different genres, maybe, like... Yeah, yeah. Ones. Mine is sort of mine was in danger of being five horror films, but it, it isn't anymore. Mm, yeah, <laughs> my mine was in the danger of having three Korea films in it, so I didn't put them in. <laughs> okay, that's probably for the best. Because I love him. Yeah, yeah. But I, not, I think, uh, not, I think not because you don't the, love I think him, because hmm? just because he was in your top five directors and we've talked about him, and then we talked about in final shots and things, and similar to me with Ben yeah. Wheatley, probably. Yeah, exactly. So I there's been other time for that. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll we'll do an we'll do an episode on Koreeda. Oh, okay. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe you could do top five Koreeda, and I could do top five Ben Wheatley in an episode. Yeah. Um. So and then I can finally watch a field in England. Oh my god, that was, that was almost in my top five. That was so so close to being in my top five. Because I'm not going to watch it voluntarily. You have to make me watch it. <laughs> It's not even scary. It's just, I've, although it just probably find, you'd find bizarre. it, you'd find it freaky because it is, it's yeah. mad. Okay, right. So with all of that being born, also no Marvel films. This was a decade of Marvel, but we've had a top five Marvel episode. So my number five choice is a bit of an odd one because um, you, when you think about all of the masterpieces that have been released in the past decade, all the films that have won the Best Picture Oscar, um, all the kind of cult indie movies that have come out, it's probably going to feel like. I'm a moron <laughs> when I tell you that my number five film is the 2010 American found footage horror film Paranormal Activity 2. Why? Why are you a moron? You love it. So what? I do That's love it. Fine. So this is the sequel to Paranormal Activity. Um, I think it's... So Paranormal Activity is a movie that came out in, I think, 2007. Um, have you seen Paranormal Activity, Alex? No. No. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what question is that? Paranormal Activity is a very... I only watch very... horror films that you tell me to watch. I don't, I don't, watch, I don't watch him voluntarily. 
It's a, it's a film uh, that this man, Oren Pelly, made, uh, and he filmed it in his own house. This is how low, low budget the original film was. It's basically got two actors in it. They're a couple who live in this house together, uh, Micah or Mika and Katie, um, and they start to realise that strange things are happening in their home. So they get a camera, they set up cameras around their house, and they film the odd occurrences. And um, sort of as each night passes, the occurrences increase in frequency and intensity until at the end of the movie, you know, it all kicks off in quite a big way. Although not that big a way because the budget was so small. Um, I went to see it in the cinema when it came out. It scared the heck of Rooney out of me. Some people <laughs> hate these films. They don't find them scary at all because ultimately, mm. you know, there's long periods in this movie in the sequels where you're just watching footage of somebody sleeping, waiting for something to happen. I get into it in a way where that, for me, that builds tension. And when the thing finally does happen, it really can kind of, it scares me. Other people just find it boring and aren't scared by it. And if that's how you feel about it, that's totally fine. But I really enjoy them. I think the second one is superior in every way other than the lack of originality in terms of you kind of seen it before with the first movie. But if you're on board for this kind of film, I get much more out of the second one than the first one. I went to see it mm. in the cinema when I was at university and I will always remember watching it in the cinema. And this is why it's number five on my list actually because I remember watching it in the cinema being so freaked out by it um, that when we left, we lived about a... I was with my housemates and we lived about a two minute walk from the or not no probably about a five to ten minute walk from the cinema and while we'd been in the film it had started raining and not just normal rain the sort of rain where if you stand in it for five seconds you are drenched through like it was really pouring it down and it just felt so in line with the film for this intense weather to be happening as we came out of it and we ran mm. home and got soaked and then got back to the flat and were just so scared to actually go into the flat because of what we'd been watching um and it's terrifying it's a prequel to it's directed by todd williams not sure who you are but i'm sure you've made other movies uh, let's have a look not really um, but it's directed by Todd Williams. It's written by a few people, but most notably Christopher Landon, who went on to be the writer-director of Happy Death Day, Happy Death Day to You, and Freaky, mm -hmm. which I spoke about a couple of weeks ago. Um, and he sort of started by, he got his fame by writing the sequels to Paranormal Activity. It's sort of a prequel where it follows, um, the first film follows Katie and Micah, the second film follows Katie's sister, Christy, and her family. They've just had a son, Hunter, and uh, strange they bring Hunter home from the hospital and strange things start happening around his bed. And I think that's kind of what, or his cot, and that's kind of what makes this one a bit creepier is you've got a baby, there's a teenage girl, there's a dog, the cast is bigger, <laughs> there's more going on, the house is bigger, and um, there's kind of more space and more room for creepy things. I mean, a dog barking at nothing is always going to be creepy, right? Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Absolutely. Like, you show me footage of a dog staring at a wall and barking at it as if there's a person stood there, I am going to be scared. <laughs> yeah. um, equally, <laughs> you show me a video of a baby staring at something that isn't there and then crying. I'm going to find that scary. I don't care what who you are, I find that scary. Um, there is a shot at the end of this film that... Uh, <laughs> terrifies me but when I showed this film to my, my parents whenever you mention Paranormal Activity to my mum she can immediately recall this moment she says it's the most disturbing thing she's seen in a film ever um, and it is really really scary I don't want to spoil it because you know in case somebody is inspired by this to go and watch some movies that maybe they've never given much time to before um, you know check it out uh, the other thing I noticed because I've because there's a new one coming out there's a reboot coming out at some point this year because everything's been rebooted um, I've never seen all of the sequels. There's like six films overall. And I've only seen the first four, so I've decided to re-watch them. And um, I've realised that the first four Paranormal Activity films tell the exact same plot that Hereditary tells. Okay. I've never noticed before that Hered the story of Hereditary is the same story as is told across the four Paranormal Activity movies, which wow. is really interesting. I've never noticed that before. Um a classic and, uh, horror story. Yeah, I really like them. I really, really like the Paranormal Activity films. I think the second one is the, the highlight of the series. And um, people should check it out. People should give it a go. People should um, chill out and stop being such snobs. <laughs> and uh, give, it, give a chance to Paranormal Activity. So yeah, that's, that's, my, that's my number five pick, Paranormal Activity 2. Nice.
Nice. Where are you going? I'm going to go for a 2011 uh, film, Attack the Block. Okay, nice choice. Mm, So this is written and directed by uh, Joe Cornish uh, with John Boyega, the first time that I saw John Boyega, Jodie uh, Whittaker, and then some other actors that I don't really know. Nick Frost's in there, right? Yeah, yeah, Nick Frost, but the other kids. Uh, The film uh, is about an alien invasion (laughs) in uh, in a council estate in South London. And this gang of youths try and fight these aliens. And um, in the end, they find out why the aliens are attracted to uh, this this block. Uh, It is because uh, the female is there and they need to mate with her or something. And uh, that's why they, these aliens are just attacking this block because the female like fell from the sky or something on this car. And uh, the kids have it. <laughs> um, I really, I really, I really like this film. I think bringing an alien invasion to such um, mundane normality is pretty yeah. an interesting concept. Attack the Block is definitely a great film. A good choice, Alex. Thank you. What's your number four? My number four is um, a 2011 action spy film. Uh, directed by Brad Bird, who is the um, director of The Incredibles, and it is his leap from animation to live action filmmaking. And it is the um, film Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Nice. The fourth Mission Impossible movie. Um, You know, when this film came out, the Mission Impossible franchise was in danger of becoming really stale. Like, the first one came out, I think, in the late 90s and was, you know, good. Second one's pretty poor... And really felt like an early noughties kind of um, time capsule of a film. J.J. Abrams came in and directed Mission Impossible 3, where Philip Seymour Hoffman plays the bad guy. And it is it did pretty well. It was pretty popular and successful. But it seems like the second wind of this franchise really started with Mission Impossible, both Ghost Protocol uh, and Brad Bird. And I remember going to see this film on the IMAX and some of the... And the thing that continues to be the, the reason to kind of go back and continue watching these movies is the stunt work that they do is incredible. The stuff they do in camera um, mm. without just creating it all on a CGI screen uh, is is really crazy. And this in this movie, it's a really famous scene of um, Ethan Hunt, Tom Cruise's character, climbing around the Burj Khalifa, uh, the tallest building in the world in Dubai, um, while a sandstorm is, is approaching. And uh, I remember being... One of the most incredible moments I've ever had in a cinema is uh, this bit where he realises that he needs to climb down this building uh, to get into a lower floor and he's because he's up on this very top floor of it. And uh, I was watching it on the IMAX, but it was back in the days when not every scene of a film would be shot on IMAX cameras. So this the, the aspect ratio of the film kept changing where you'd be watching like a normal kind of widescreen film and then for certain mm-hmm. scenes it would flip and the entire IMAX screen would be filled with the image. And they do this incredible transition shot where it's a normal aspect ratio of a film where he's running towards this window that he's going to jump out of. And the second that he jumps and the camera follows him and then starts to pan down to show the full vista of what's below him uh, in, in Dubai, at that exact moment where it reveals the landscape, it switches from normal aspect ratio to an IMAX aspect ratio and it fills, suddenly fills your vision and it's the kind of experience you can only have in a cinema. It's not going to be repeated at home. You know, if you're watching it at home, it's one of those unique moments that you only get kind of when a film's released and you go and see it in the cinema. And it blew me away. It's one of the most exciting moments I've ever seen in the film. And the entire movie is great. Um, Jamie Renner's in this film, Simon Pegg, Paula Patton. Sadly departed Michael Nykvist, who plays the villain, who's great in this movie. Uh, Leah Sado in an early role is really, really good in this film. Um, it it moves. It's got an incredible pace to it. Uh, Paula Patton as well as in this film is really good. Um, the pacing is really really good. It just moves and moves and moves, and it kind of hits on what makes Mission Impossible exciting is that they have these moments where things have to happen really quickly. They don't have much time to improvise, and all of their plans fall apart. Their gadgets break. Nothing works. It's not like James Bond where he turns up to a place. And his, gap, his grappling hook works and he gets into the building and all his things go off perfectly. In the world of Mission Impossible, Simon Pegg is your tech man and all of his gadgets and things just break, com- completely mm. fall apart and break and they have to improvise and they're always running against the clock and um, it does kind of 
it's a really good kind of well-paced exciting action film the sequence around the Burj Khalifa in Dubai is definitely the highlight of the movie but the entire rest of the film is just stunning um it's for me it's the best film in the Mission Impossible franchise and that's a franchise that I really enjoy so yeah it's my number four I've only watched two Mission Impossibles which have you seen one and two all right okay you've seen sort of the worst two (laughs) um I mean, the first one's really good, actually. The second one, I yeah, don't have much time for the second one. Yeah, the first one is amazing. Yeah. Um, I, know that, uh, yeah, I know that you, like a lot of people, kind of find it difficult to watch Tom Cruise movies, for good reason. Uh, but um, the, the kind of the craft going on behind the scenes in these films is, is like none other. Uh, and I definitely recommend going through, you know, mm. watch the third one if you want to, but Try and, try and watch Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol and then the two sequels, Rogue Nation and Fallout, because they're so well made. Like, no one is making action movies like this anymore. It's all, like, Marvel. the Marvel movies are great, but they're so kind of composited on green screens and all put together by visual effects teams. Uh, and there's a lot mm. of that going on in the Mission Impossible movies, obviously, but there's also these incredible um, sequences that they do for real uh, and go to these locations and, and have people hanging off the sides of planes or jumping over Paris, jumping, you know, skydiving into Paris and all of these mad things. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's good. It's good stuff. And there's a couple more on the way. So yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Okay. So that's my number four. What's your number four? Um, My number four is a 2019 film and it's a war film uh, directed by Sam Mendes and it's called Uh, 1917. Yes. Uh, So um, this film is about uh, this is set in the First World War and uh, two British soldiers, um, they have to have an order to uh they have to go across enemy territory um to give a message that could save a lot of soldiers yeah um and so uh it's just these two kids <laughs> trying to save some soldiers by going you know an impossible journey yeah. um and uh, it starts in the trenches. And I think the beginning scene in the trenches is so, like, from the beginning till the end, you're just like, uh, but it starts in the trenches where there's mud and they're, like, all one on top of each other. And you kind of see how the the people in the war were. Um, and then um, they have to start crossing the fields the first bit when they have to like get out and then they have to go um from each moment they are on their journey uh it's you you saw you see something brutal about that particular war but probably any any war and um that was that was more of a, a war of position so like we are fighting each other from here to here so you had to kind of understand you know the enemy uh but um it's it's an amazing film and it's beautifully shot and i just i really enjoy i enjoy enjoyed i really i really i don't know how to feel about this film because i think it's amazing i think it shows a a part of it shows like the horribleness of war that there's nothing even if you're on the winning side who's winning in reality and well yeah um, especially in in that war there was no yeah good guys or bad guys it was just sort of meaningless yeah and the fact that the young kids are always the ones that go yeah forward and other ones in the trenches and other ones that need to give the message um and i think one of one of the scenes that was really kind of I don't, there's a scene where he's um in the town and it looks like they're in a theater and with all the lights and that's a beautiful scene oh um, yeah, cinematogra- yeah. Cin- cinematographically cin- cinematographically incredible uh, mm. but i think the one that touched me the most is when he arrives and he hears the song. Oh yeah, that sequence. And he is just beautiful. sits down. Yeah. 
and it's just like I don't know it's just it's really it's really touching and it's really beautiful film and uh there's it shows how pointless wars are yeah. in an incredible uh way uh, yeah. some menders made in my opinion a masterpiece where um yeah it's a master for me personally i think it's a great war film yeah i don't think many people are going to disagree with you it's a pretty yeah i mean it's yeah, yeah. it's amazing um, yeah, the uh, yeah I saw it in the IMAX and it was one of it was it was an amazing experience seeing that film on a on a massive mm. screen and uh, yeah because yeah. I think I'm glad I watched it at the cinema because I think it's one of those films that has to be watched at the cinema because it's you need, so yeah you need to be able to give it your full attention yeah yeah and yeah. you have to be like co- yeah concentrated on that and the acting is amazing um, uh, George McKay. Um, yeah. And uh, Dean Charles Chapman are uh, the two boys that have to uh, take the message. Uh, yeah. Mark Strong is in it. Um, Andrew Scott, uh, Richard Madden, uh, Colin Firth, Benedict Cumberbatch, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, he drops in all these massive actors, doesn't he, for yeah. like five minute sort of Five minutes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, but mainly is George McKay that he is the main character, which yeah. he looks like such an old school English man, doesn't he? Yeah, he's perfectly cast. He looks exactly like he's perfect. from that era. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. My granddad looked like that. <laughs> you know, like perfect. Um, and uh, I, I love that he took the time to then take get. Uh, there's a there's a um, there's a seat um, there's a foreign actor from those times uh naban rizawan uh who i think is indian but he plays a sikh oh yeah um just to show that it wasn't just white british people but it was also other countries helping england or people from other countries helping england so you know don't be so um never mind uh but yeah so uh no i think it's a great film uh came came at a, an incredible time and yeah very good and how you can make a film out of stories that you've heard from your grandpa you know mm. it's not it's not a real film but it could be a real a real thing yeah it's just stories that um sam mendes's granddad told him and uh yeah i really like it good what's your number three my number three is a movie that we talk about all the time. It sort of comes up yeah. pretty much every week. It's already been mentioned today in this episode. Has it? Yes, it has. Um, and there's finally a suitable slot for it in a, in a top five list. So it's going in there. Number three uh, in my top five movies from the tens is the 2015 period drama folktale film direct, written and directed by Robert Eggers, The Witch. <laughs> uh, this film stars uh, Ralph Innocent and Kate Dickey as a couple who are cast out of their Puritan town in um, the 1630s in New England in America and have to start a farmstead on their own out on the edge of a forest. Um, they have f- five children, I think. Their oldest is played oh. by the perfect Anya Taylor Joy. Um, but they also have a pair of twins, a young lad and a baby, all of which that they need to support and look after. Um, and it's kind of about, you know, the film, it's categorised as a horror film, it's put in the horror category all the time. It's more, it's it's almost more a f- period drama movie that has a supernatural element to it and, you know, horrific things happen to this family. They're starting their farmstead, the, there's a point where the baby disappears and that causes all kinds of consternation. The crops start to fail, they're diseased, what's going on? You occasionally see these glimpses of someone in the woods uh, mashing up roots and herbs or making potions or doing something and it all kind of builds and builds and builds. The The twins start acting strangely um, and yeah, eventually everything kind of falls apart and it goes wild. Um, what I love about the movie is the actors are really good in it. Ralph Innocent is... Um, such a great actor. He started off, as most people will know him, as Finchy, the David Brent's best friend in The Office, the UK mm. office. Um, 
and he popped up in this movie, and he's got such this, he's got this distinctive, really deep, gravelly voice, and he's perfect for this kind of uh, period movie. Um, and then obviously it's the first time pretty much anyone was introduced to Anya Taylor Joy, who's ended up becoming this sort of mega star, rightfully so, because she's so good yeah. and she's great in this film. She recently did an interview where she said. She, I think she said when she first, the first time she watched The Witch, she thought that her career was over because she thought she'd done such a bad job. Um, but then obviously the, the exact opposite was true. People loved her in it and it, it sort of, everything took off. Um, Robert Eggers is very much um, into doing things as sort of accurately as possible. So the movie is filmed entirely um, with natural light or light that would be available in that period. There's no electrical lighting used in any of the sequences. Mm. It's all sort of candlelit or sunlit. Um, he read court transcripts from that era and from that period and place in America to kind of try and get his script and dialogue as accurate as possible to the to the place. And it does, you know, it feels like a very... Um, it feels authentic because they're talking in a way that, you know, people wouldn't talk today... Uh, very differently from, for example, the the Fair Street movie set in sixteen sixty six that we that I talked about last week, where the characters sort of talk almost like characters would talk in the present day, just with a slight kind of old English inflection. Whereas in this movie, they are talking, um, and you know, constructing sentences just in a way that people don't nowadays. So he clearly put a lot of effort into that, and it's become kind of a bit of a modern classic. People love this movie. There's a goat in it called Black Philip, um, that has become an icon, and of of horror. And um, it's great. It's it's not necessarily the scariest horror film ever made. It's not even necessarily a horror film, but as a as a sort of period drama, a creepy, twisty folk tale film um, that sort of sets great, makes great atmosphere and setting. It's um, about as good as it gets, and I really love it. So, um, the witch, a New England folk tale, is my number three pick. Hmm. I might watch that one, but I'm not watching Paranormal Activity. <laughs> yeah okay fair enough um what's your number three uh my number three is uh 2018 my only no maybe the other one well horror film okay uh a quiet place oh wow good choice a quiet place yes uh, so uh, is a film which is uh, directed by uh, John Krasinski. Was it also written by John Krasinski? Um, yes. Well, he came up with yeah, the story. Yeah, he did the screenplay. Somebody, yeah, yeah, he might have worked so with somebody. The story. But he, yeah. So kind of like created by an idea created by John Krasinski, Krasinski, yeah. and um, it uh, with um, Emily Blunt which uh, is amazing here and um and the and Millicent Simmons who plays the daughter and Noah Jupe who plays the son the the film is set uh, 89 days um after uh, the earth's human population well a lot of earth's human population has been in annihilated annihilated by these creatures that are blind but have an incredible uh, sense of hearing and so you cannot make any type of uh, sound and this family uh, played by uh, John Krasinski, uh, Emily Blunt, Millicent Simmons and Noah Jupe um, are living in this uh, post-apocalyptic uh, world and trying to survive in this post-apocalyptic world and um it starts in with them in a shop and it's all very quiet but very tense <laughs> and then they <laughs> and um I'm done in an amazing way because it's just like extremely quiet yeah. and it's so creepy and um y- y- you don't really know at the beginning why on what is the repercussion of making any noise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you find out <laughs> what is the repercussion of making any noise because after they leave the shop, unfortunately the son um, has a very noisy toy gun and you find out what these creatures are. Rocket ship. 
Hmm? It's a toy is a rocket, rocket ship. It's a rocket oh, ship. I thought it was it's like a, a space gun. shuttle. Is that a ro- no. Oh, okay. Um, what I forgot to tell is that uh, the mother is pregnant, heavily yeah. pregnant. <laughs> yep. So at some point, this child is going to be born. And bad idea. It's just bad idea. <laughs> Not a good idea. <laughs> Not a Baby's good idea. But I guess because it's 89 days after she was pregnant before this happened. So Yeah, she, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so um, unfortunately... Uh, pregnant at the wrong time um but um the daughter is deaf so they can communicate which is you know in a way lucky because they can communicate with sign language um and uh they uh it's just this the story about them surviving uh this post post apocalyptic world and not trying to make any noise and giving birth in silence. So perfect for if you're a Scientologist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true. Uh, yeah, um, I think it's a great film, great concept. Uh, never, you know, uh, it's such a simple idea of uh, alien that you have to be quiet. And it could have gone very banal, but it was so well done. Yeah, that it was tense, engaging, entertaining, scary. Um, it it it's a great film. It's uh it's really really good, and I think, um, yeah, it's a fantastic yeah. film. It's interesting because it, like when you say it could be easily be really banal. Um, an example of that is the Netflix film Bird Box starring Sandra Bullock, which is. Yeah, it's crazily similar to a quiet place, but mm. instead of sound, it's sight. You can't see them, so you have to. If you go outside, mm. you have to cover your eyes and stuff. That movie is rubbish, and, mm. and it's got the same, almost sort of the same premise as a quiet place, and it makes all the wrong decisions and ends up being a big pile of uh, garbage, in my opinion. Yeah. Whereas a quiet place is like just does it perfectly. Yeah, exactly, and, and that's why I love this film because I wasn't going to watch it. You made me watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that and get out and both of them incredible concepts for films done in an amazing way and i think that's probably like in a way what represents 2010 like evolution of cinema simple but effective yeah yeah because get i mean it, it it came out around a similar sort of time to get out yeah and get out again has got a very simple premise um but it's just executed flawlessly yeah. It's just refined to perfection. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and yeah. I think the same for get uh, for A Quiet Place. And I can't wait to watch A Quiet Place 2. Well, the so, crazy yeah. thing about A Quiet Place 2 is it's it, I think it's better than the first one, which shouldn't even yeah. be possible. That's what Emily Blunt said. She she was in an interview and she said, I, I shouldn't say this, but I think it's better. It's yeah. Amazing. It's yeah, you great. might not agree, but... Um, and it's 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 they're very very close, but for me, I think I like the second one just slightly more, which is wild because the first one is is so good. Um, but that's yeah. how it should go, shouldn't it? Like a series or a film, the franchise should get better and better, shouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't definitely. go the opposite direction. No, but it always does. And, yeah, and it always, and that's the problem. It always does, but if it gets better, that's fantastic, and you know, yeah, good on definitely. John Krasinski. Great idea. And, you know, amazing performance from Emily Blunt. She's so good in yeah. it. Yeah, she really is. Yeah. A great choice. Danke. You're welcome. Okay. My, <laughs> my number two. Um, yeah. uh, my number two is a film that I almost didn't put on my list because it's not sort of in my wheelhouse of the things mm. I enjoy na- necessarily, if you see what I mean. But I just... Mm. Uh, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, no, I love this movie. There's a performance in this movie that would is one of my top performances in any film ever, of, ever, um, of all time, and it's just it's just kind of a perfect um, drama. It's just a drama uh, film. Um, it is the 2014 American film written and directed by Damien Chazelle uh, mm-hmm. called Whiplash. Oh, I thought you might put that one. Oh really? <laughs> Have yeah. you seen Whiplash? Yeah. No, I still haven't seen it. Yeah, interesting. I need to. Um, so I'll watch Whiplash tells one hundred percent. No, that's definitely not going to be homework. Uh, Whiplash <laughs> tells the story <laughs> of um, a young man 
uh, played by Miles Teller, who wants to be a jazz drummer, and he's gotten into a very exclusive New York music school called Schaefer um, as a jazz drummer, um, which is his dream. And he manages to get into the jazz band, which is being led by and trained by um, a ruthless jazz instructor called Terence Fletcher, played by J.K. Simmons, who is a monster in this film. This film is almost like a horror movie because J.K. Simmons is monstrous in this film. And the fact that his character is apparently inspired by real jazz instructors or real music instructors that you that, mm. that, that the um, director encountered in his time at these kind of prestigious uh, music schools is wild. And like, it's this incredible drama about these two characters who both desperately want to be perfect and um, kind of how, particularly Miles Teller's character, the young student, how his obsession with trying to be perfect and getting into this band and being what J.K. Simmons wants him to be kind of leads him to sac- make crazy sacrifices in his life um, just to try and be this perfect drummer. And it's a film looking at obsession and how obsession can kind of um, affect your life and be detrimental to your life. And um, it's just incredible. There's some, some of the scenes in this movie are the tensest I've ever felt while watching a film. Um, mm. And it's the fact that it's all based around jazz drumming, something that I honestly don't know anything about and I'm not interested in. It's, it's like how Florence Pugh made fighting with my family and managed to make me interested in um, or invested in wrestling. This film makes me invested in jazz drumming in a way that I just didn't think would ever happen. Mm. Um, and yeah, it all, I mean, really, it comes down to J.K. Simmons. Like, he is incredible in this movie. Um, he won an Oscar for it, correctly so. And um, yeah, it's just it's just a it's kind of it's kind of a perfect it's just a perfect film. It's not a genre film. I normally mm. kind of would put genre. I kind of go crazy for genre movies, spy films, and horror films, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is just a, a story, a tale, a, dra- a drama movie about these two characters, and um, it's incredible. It's perfect, and um, yeah. Well done, Damien Chazelle. You, you made a perfect mm. movie with your first movie. And I, I don't think he was even 30 when he made it, which is just Amazing. bonkers. Um, and it's it's kind of helped J.K. Simmons become respected everywhere. in the way that he's always deserved to be. Um, he's he's a everywhere busy man. now. Yeah. Um, and rightfully so. So, yeah, that's it. That's Whiplash, my number two. Not quite my tempo. On a list I saw, they put it under um, a thriller. <laughs> It, I mean, it sort of almost is, even though it's not. Yeah. There's no action in it. There's no like real violence in mm. it. There's not. There's not any genuine stakes. No one's life is in danger. Well, there might be one scene, mm. like, but, but like it's not. That's not really what it's about. But it kind of is. It's kind of a psychological thriller about jazz drumming. It's it's wild, and it, I think it's just about the first film on screen in that um, YouTube video you sent me as well, because um, mm. I think it really is kind of one yeah. of the iconic films of this past decade. So yeah, it's just the best. Mm. So that's my number two. Yeah. Cool. What's your number two? My number two is a film, uh, a two thousand and fifteen. A uh, post-apocalyptic action film uh, called Mad Max Fury Road. Oh, wow. Okay, nice. I, was, I don't know why it popped. I was like, I just, I just, I, I, I kept, like, a bit like you, I kept pushing it away. <laughs> and I was like, but it's so good. It's like, yeah. but it's such a silly film, but it's so good. Yeah, well, it's silly. It's, it's not silly. It's amazing. But I, I was like, you don't like that film. And then I watched, yeah, it's a, I love it. Uh, but yeah, so it's, um, but wouldn't has... it be better if Wiley e. Coyote and the Roadrunner were in it? Ah, oh, shut up. <laughs> in fact, wait, <laughs> come on. Um, so, uh, this has got an incredible cast, uh, Tom Hardy as Max, uh, Charlize Theron as Imperator Furiosa. There's also Nicholas Holt, um, uh, Zoe Kravis, Rosie Huntington Whiteley, which she doesn't say much in there. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's uh, what is it about? So uh, <laughs> the planet is collapsing. Uh, there is uh, nothing. There is no well. All the resources are um, not available, and is basically a deserted landscape. And uh, humanity is. 
weird and broken and ugly. It's very ugly. Like there's some very ugly things in that film. Mm. And um it's everybody is kind of crazy trying to fight for things uh for necessity. Uh so there's there's a there's a despot uh, the leader is this ugly thing that has got everything. So the world has nothing, but he has got everything. And he's got five wives and Imperator, Imperator Furiosa uh, leads their escape. And she makes an alliance with Max, who is this loner, insane kind of guy. And uh, they uh, it's basically a, a, a chase film. <laughs> so they get chased constantly. Yeah, the movie is a chase. People. The entire film is a chase. The entire film is a chase. And then when they arrive, where Imperator, Imperator, so Imperator uh, Furiosa thinks that if she reaches uh, her village or where her family used to live, everything would be fine. But then she has a surprise that everything won't be fine and no. then this chase film becomes I'm going to go back for it, it's crazy yeah it's crazy the structure of the movie is they drive all the way out to this place and then they, they just turn around all and the drive way, <laughs> and you think that that is where they're going to be no. and then they drive back and you go no, what? and I think that's why it's such a great film yeah it's it's uh, it's a film that where it just is a two hour film where they just drive and fight other people in this the craziest ways with the craziest people. Yeah. Um Nicholas Holt is disgust this disgusting creature in it. As a war um, boy. One of the war boys. Yeah. And everything is just slightly odd and creepy and yeah. um it's amazing. It's fun. It's crazy. Is for me is such a good film, and I love it. And I think I watched it with you at the cinema. Yeah, I think I saw it twice at the cinema. Maybe I think I saw yeah. it and then I maybe went with you again to see it because I was like, you got to see yeah. this. Film. Yeah, yeah, and I was like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to <laughs> see this film. It's gonna be rubbish. Like I watched Mad Max with um, what's his name? What's his name? The first Mel Gibson. One. Mel Gibson. Oh, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not interested in any other Mad Maxes. They yeah. can't do any better. Well, but they did. Oh, they did. Well, you know, it's it's kind of an '80s classic, isn't it, Mad Max? Well, the first, the first Mad Max is such a low budget film that it kind of doesn't. I don't rate personally the first Mad Max film very much. It's kind of interesting, but it's yeah, crazily low budget. The second and third ones are quite good, but yeah, I mean, you wouldn't yeah. have any idea watching them kind of how good it could get with Fury Road. Mm. But it is amazing. Charlize Theron is amazing in it. Uh, her and Tom Hardy have absolutely 100% hate for each other. And I think it was off screen as well. They didn't like each other. It sounds like I'm it was not, not sure an easy we... film to make, which you can tell. <laughs> you can tell, but also it adds to... Oh. Because they're not supposed to like each other in the film. No. And I think... It it shows and it's perfect. I love this film. It's so good. Yeah, it's an yeah. incredible choice. Yeah, it's, it is. It is an amazing movie. Do you know about the prequel? Yeah, they're going to make another one, aren't, aren't they? Yeah, what about uh, Charlize Theron didn't get called, did she, to do? Well, no, because it's it. it's, a, it's it's about Imperator Furiosa as a young woman. Do you know who's playing her? No. Anya. Taylor, Taylor Joy. Joy, of course. Sorry, yeah. Charlie's. I mean, Charlie's Swan's incredible in this movie, but yeah, as a young version of that character, I'm pretty excited to see what Anya Taylor Joy brings to it. And then you've got Chris Hemsworth in there as well, I think, and um, a few other good actors. So I'm interested to see the to see the prequel. George Miller going back to the world of Mad Max and making another film uh, can't be a bad thing. So yeah, no, no and and yeah, Mad Max Fury Road is a five star film. It's a modern masterpiece. It's a great choice for number two. Yeah, let's go yeah. to your number one, man. Okay, so my number one is a film from 2019. So I started with... Uh, number five, I started with a film from 2010. I'm finishing with a film from 2019. I've gone across the whole decade. Um, wow. It's a film that when I went to see it in the cinema, I went to see it on my own because I just knew I'd like it. I kind of I, I kind of knew that I wanted to see it. So And I, I just went on my own to see it at the cinema one night after work and it made me cry. And I when it finished, I sat there and just 
couldn't even get up for a couple of minutes. I just sat there and just sort of absorbed what I just watched. I love this movie. It's one of my favourite films of all time. And there was never any doubt that it was going to be my number one film of that decade. Um, it is a film, it is a mystery film written and directed by Ryan Johnson called Knives Out. Yes, baby. Yeah. Um, I think it's the first one I wrote. No, it's the second one I wrote on my on my honourable mentions. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, let me read, just read out the cast list. Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, Anna Diarmas. Jamie Lee Curtis, Michael Shannon, Don Johnson, Tony Collette, Lakeith Stanfield, Catherine Langford, Jaden Martell, Christopher Plummer. I mean, he pulled together an incredible, an insane cast of characters for this movie. Um, yeah. It's Ryan Johnson sort of doing an homage to Agatha Christie. He's got Daniel Craig playing this incredible detective character um, called uh, Benoit Blanc, who is called to the house of um, Harlan Thromby and a best-selling crime novelist who has uh, passed away under mysterious circumstances. And Daniel Craig, Benoit Blanc, is tasked with discovering what really happened. And he recruits um, the nurse of uh, Harlan Fromby, played by Anna Diarmas, Marta Cabrera, to um, help him try to find out the truth. And as the movie goes on, it takes various twists and turns. You uh, you find out a lot about the various family members um, in this family, uh, played by these incredible actors, um, and they all could be potential suspects. They all have things hidden away that you find out as the movie goes on. Um, and when it finally, when the final reveals are made and you find out really what's happening, it kind of, I mean, I'm sure some people predicted it, but it's hard to predict how this movie goes. It ends up being way more political than you ex- expect. It makes comments about the world we live in, how we view each other, how we treat yeah. each other, how we treat people that we perceive as being other to ourselves, um, and how we kind of ignore people because they're not don't have the same status as us. Mm-hmm. And um, it's incredible. It's a masterpiece. I, I love it so 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 much. And um. I'm really nervous about it. They're making two sequels. Netflix have paid $400 million um, for the rights to these oh two sequels. Goodness. And, um, yeah, Knives Out 2 is currently being filmed in Greece and it's got a cast basically as good as the cast from Night. You've got Daniel Craig has come back as Benoit Blanc. There's Yay! an entirely new um, mystery for him to solve. And the actors in this one, I mean, you've got Dave Bautista, Edward Norton, Janelle Monae, Catherine Hahn, Leslie Odom Jr., Kate Hudson, uh, Jessica Henwick, Ethan Hawke, Jada Plinkett Smith. I mean, is I, 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 I was, what's the sequel going to be about? I don't know, but the first one is just perfect. It's a perfect film. Um, all of the people that hate Ryan Johnson because of how they perceive him ruining Star Wars with the last Jedi put your, um, you know, put your prejudices against him to the side for a minute and uh, mm. watch Knives Out of an Open Mind and you'll see kind of how talented he, he is capable of being. Because, um, yeah, it's just the best. It's just the absolute best. And, yeah, there we go. That's that's my number one, Knives Out. Nice. Thank you. I like it. Good. I'm glad you like it. What's your number one? Uh, my number one is a film that I've spoken about before but I absolutely and I watched recently and I absolutely fell in love with this film and it, this is the first one I put in my list because I think it is the film of the decade wow. um, like I, I, I love it and um, and uh, the film is a 2016 film um, called Moonlight Ah. Yes, so I spoke about it before, but you know, it stars uh, Maher Sara Ali, uh, Janelle Monet, uh, Naomi Harris, and then um, as uh, and then Alex R. Hibbert, Ashton Sanders, and Trevante Rhodes as playing the same uh, person in different times, uh, time times yeah and um so this is uh it's this film is set in three times period periods young adolescent young adolescents mid-teen and young adult um uh of this the main character chiron it's a beautiful coming of age story uh is amazingly done it's just beautiful it's just a beautiful film to watch and to experience i think and it's so well done and it's just a beautiful slice of life coming of age film that is really really well made and um yeah 
and I think it's just a great film. Nice. Mm. A good choice, probably. I haven't seen it, as you know, but a good choice. Yeah. 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 Good. And amazing oh. film thing is, after you watch, like, the poster looks like it's the same person. Yeah. But it's not. Yeah. The poster has got, like, the uh, has got Little, and then in the middle has got uh, Tyrone, and then in the... um. So they they he's three different timelines. Yeah, yeah. But they've yeah. done it so well that it looks like the same person. And it's really weird. I've just noticed it today. <laughs> That's impressive. I like it. A good choice. Did you ever see it? Sorry? Did you ever see it? That like have you ever the, seen the posters? Oh like, no, yeah, it's a very I yeah, no, no, no. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's got the three it's almost a, it's like three slightly shaded in three different colours. It's like a triangular cut yeah. between the three faces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It is good. It's amazing. Yeah. But yeah. Nice. Cool. Cool. Good picks. Okay, so shall I run through my top five? Yeah. So my top five was for the best films of the tens. Uh, number five, Paranormal Activity 2. Number four, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. Number three, The Witch. Number two, Whiplash. And number one, Knives Out. Fantastic. And my list was number five, Attack the Block. Uh, number four, 1917. Number three, uh, A Quiet Place. Number two, Mad Max Fury Road. And number one, Moonlight. Nice. Um, I have a few honourable mentions to go through. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going gonna... to say yes if I've got it. So right, then okay. I well, don't so... have to, because like, if not, it's going to be like six hours of honourable mentions. Yeah, it's a longish list. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk briefly about the first three because they were so close to being on my list and then the others I'm just going to say the names of them Um, but The Nightingale Jennifer Kent's follow up to The Babadook is an incredible period film um, set in Tasmania about this Irish convict woman travelling across to avenge uh, well for revenge um, for reasons something that happens in the start of the film it's an incredible movie Um, it was kind of between that and The Witch and I went for The Witch eventually in terms of like a really accurate feeling period movie but this movie has a lot to say about um, British colonialism, how it affected uh, Tasmanian particularly. And, mm. uh, yeah, it's a great film. A Dark Song is a really low budget British movie about occultism um, uh, set in Wales, and it's uh, it's got um, Steve Oram from uh, Sightseers in it. And it's a film that probably most people listening to this might not have heard of. It's a really really small film, but it's incredible. It's a five star film. It's so so good. I'd recommend people look up a dark song. And lastly, a field in England, the Ben Wheatley movie um, that Alex has to watch at some point. Um, it's so so good. Uh, after that, I've got Black Swan, uh, The Cabin in the Woods, Killer Joe, The Raid, The Innkeepers, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, uh, Dread, The Borderlands, The World's End. The Great Gatsby, Evil Dead, The Conjuring, Ex Machina, John Wick, Spring, Nightcrawler, Starry Eyes, Edge of Tomorrow, It Follows, Creep, Calvary, What We Do in the Shadows, The Guest, The Babadook, The Law, Creed, The Big Short, Hell House, High Rise, The Lobster, Mad Max Fury Road, Mindhorn, Better Watch Out, Prevenge, Arrival, Train to Busan, The Wailing, Hush, Blade Runner 2049, Revenge, The Death of Stalin, Wonder Woman, The Endless, Halloween, Suspiria, Under the Silver Lake, Blockers, A Quiet Place, Annihilation, Game Night, Black Panther, Hereditary, Mandy, Doctor Sleep, The Irishman, Jojo Rabbit, Uncut Gems, Joker, Marriage Story, and Fighting With My Family. And that is after cutting about 100 films out of my original list i agree with a lot with a few of them the beginning i didn't know what you were talking about those were just words blah 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 blah. um (laughs) fair enough um yeah what about Uh, you so um i've put uh sicario Mm -hmm. endgame Mm -hmm. birdman Mm -hmm. kingsman Get Out, uh, The Farewell, Sorry We Missed You, Parasite, The Handmaiden, Midsummer, The Truth, uh, all of Wes Anderson's films in 2010, all of Corrida, <laughs> into the tens, all the yeah. Corrida films in ten, the tens, Fair three enough. billboards, um, Your Name, 
uh, Hunt for the Wilder People, Monsters, Source Code, and yeah. It just was a great year, a great, 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 great decade. It was, indeed. That. Great. Okay, so, um, homework. What Home. I... Oh, hello. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, you need to watch The Witch, please. Okay. <laughs> With Anya Taylor-Joy. Not Mission Impossible 4. Anya Taylor-Joy. You love Anya Taylor-Joy. I do. However, it looks scary. Uh, and you have to watch Moonlight. Yeah, that's fine. I can do that. I can watch Moonlight. Yeah. Good, 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 good. Um, do you have a recommend? Oh, uh, uh, well, uh, let's. I'll start. I have a recommendation for this week from, um, or a couple of recommendations. I would recommend, um, Werewolves of In, uh, is a good mm-hmm. film, easily missed. So please check it out. And the new Dave album, We're All Alone in This Together, is worth your time as well. Cool. And I would recommend Villains, the film. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Mm. Nice. <laughs> good. Good. Um, right, that's been our forty second episode. Um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, next time for episode forty three, we're going to be doing. Um, it, well, I, I'm assuming we're going to be doing our top five bands from the from this decade. Yeah, that's gonna be hot. <laughs> that's gonna be. It's gonna be an interesting <laughs> one. Uh, recent, more kind of newer, younger bands, probably mainly. Yeah. Um, like see what we come up with. Uh, be interesting. One Direction. Sure, <laughs> they could be on there. Yeah. Um. So yeah, yeah, yeah. As long as they kind of started right at the end of the t- the noughties or in the tens, I think they're probably fair game. So uh, yeah, there we go. Um, please follow us on Instagram and uh, the various other social media places we go to. Please join our Facebook discussion group, the Culture Bucket Bucket Squad, um, to chat there about what we've been talking about or anything you're interested in talking about. And um, you can find links to everything we've discussed in Culture Catch-Up and MyTube, as well as links to all of those social media pages I just mentioned in the show notes of this episode and every episode. Um, So please go there and have a look at that. And uh, yeah, join us next time for our top five bands from the tens. And it's been an absolute pleasure as always. Thank you so much. Love you. Bye. Bye.